central banks have doubled down on what they've said. We've seen such a surge in inflation that the European Central Bank, like the US Fed, has decided it needs to be seen as fighting inflation. The Fed follows monetary policy based on what's best for the United States, and the consequences of the rest of the world are the consequences for the rest of the world. The elephant in the room is global growth, and that's the elephant in the room of the euro. It's hard to say that we're done with the high prices and how that's going to affect people. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from London for our audience worldwide, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. A momentous week in the history of the United Kingdom, a seamless transition from Queen to King, Tom Keen from Mother to Son. It is that, John, but far more, as King Charles said at Westminster Hall in the last hour, an example of selfless duty. As we talked about here, he has to make the shiv shift from Prince Charles to King Charles III, some of that happening over the weekend. His words earlier this morning, Lisa, I cannot help but feel the weight of history. And I think we all feel that in this very moment through Espe the rest of this week. Especially because this queen really saw a massive transition for the United Kingdom, for the world on several scales. And King Charles II is entering a very new regime, both on an economic as well as a social level, that right. has a very different view toward the monarchy. John, one question I have to you. The stunning television footage on Saturday, I was honored to witness at Mansion House and the Royal Exchange, the announcement of the king. To see it on TV, the accession on TV must have been a shock for the nation. A series of proclamations across the country, and Tom, I think that one thing many people have said repeatedly over the last week is that we all knew this moment would eventually come. And right. then it comes and you feel utterly unprepared for the emotion that comes with it. And I yeah. think that emotion resonates with a lot of people across the United Kingdom today and this morning, and it will do through yeah. the rest of this week. As an American in the United Kingdom, I thought Therese Raphael for Bloomberg Opinion was stunning, and she said, you're never prepared, and that's what the weekend felt like. We'll catch up with the Bloomberg team a little bit later this afternoon in London, this morning for you over in the United States. Got to whip through the price action as well. Decent couple of days, back week of gains on the S&P 500 going all the way back to the end of July. We're up about 3.65% on the S&P last week. Futures right now positive 20 points on the S&P 500, up a half of 1%. Yields coming in, Lisa, about a basis point or two, 329.45 on a 10-year. 10 10-year 10 yields have been climbing for six straight weeks. It's sort of stunning, especially considering the fact that so many people were saying yields were have already seen their highs, at least in the long end. And Deutsche Bank put out a survey this morning saying that more people thought that yields could go on 10-year treasuries to 5%. Than 1%. Next. I haven't heard that. Wow. Yeah, so that basically wow. was uh, the latest in the zeitgeist. Today, we are tracking the movement of the Queen's coffin as traveling to St. Giles uh, Cathedral in Edinburgh, where the, she will be on repose for everyone to come and mourn and really deal with the emotion not only of her passing as a symbol, but also the reign that really simplified and amplified an entire era uh, for the United Kingdom, many eras, as well as the rest of the world. Then you have uh, King Charles II flying to Scotland. That's where he is on his way, and he is going to be meeting there with Nicola Sturgeon, First Minister of Scotland, as well as being there with the coffin. At 8 a.m. Eastern Time, ECB's Isabel Schnabel is going to be welcome, giving welcoming remarks to the 7th Annual ECB Research Conference in Frankfurt. One of the biggest moves of the morning is the euro, strengthening the most in six months versus the dollar as people take a look at some hawkish rhetoric over the weekend by a number of ECB officials and talk about how to counter some of the weakness that really has been driven by high electricity prices. And then at 12 p.m. Eastern, we're watching the food backdrop. The World Agricultural Supply and Demand September report is due out. And, John, this comes as, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I've been going to the grocery stores looking for fruits and vegetables, and there's less and less available. And I know that this is just anecdotal, but if you look at the actual data, it is also bearing out, whether it's in the United Kingdom or whether it's in the U.S., because of weather, because of lack of planting, and a whole host of other issues that are really creating some issues. As someone funded in dollars this week, are you feeling wealthier? at the United Kingdom at about 115, 116 <laughs> on sterling. You want to know the truth? I, I would love to know the truth. Absolutely. Are you? 100%. Yeah, you could actually feel the difference because you can kind of transfer it into almost one-to-one -one rather than, you know, one and you one You know who else quarter. is feeling the difference is TK. Get a good weekend, Tom. You know, it was an interesting weekend, <laughs> if I can mention this. That's a uh, punt. <laughs> we've got so much to do to go to Lizzie Burden, but I attended the Requiem Mass for the Queen at the uh, Westminster uh, Cathedral, which the That's symbolism special. of this was really extraordinary. The Duchess of Kent there, uh, who converted to Catholic faith in 1994, but that was one of the moments of the weekend. I took Lisa on a tour, Tom, a walking tour. 
Did all, you? All the way down to Buckingham Which, Palace. How many bars did you have? Actually, on the way to Buckingham <laughs> Palace. I, I gave her a history of the city of London. This is the Arsenal uh, bar. Down to Lord's Temple, down to Westminster. Then we went down. Did you to get out to West Palace. Ham? Did you go the other way? Made it to Mayfair and. It was phenomenal. It was go. an incredible walk through history. I made it you missed, to. You missed the, out on that. I made it to the garden room in Mayfair. At the I bet Wayne you Thorne. did. Let's start the team coverage. Bloomberg's Lizzie Verdon outside Buckingham <laughs> Palace. Maria Tadeo is in Brussels. Lizzie, Lisa went through briefly the day ahead for this country. Can you walk us through again in detail what we can expect today and through the rest of this week? Well, John, I have to say, I arrived here before the sun came up and it was quiet, it was sombre, people were paying their respects. But now the mood is really lifting here at Buckingham Palace. They've got the beef eaters, the bagpipes, the horses. They're really just trying to lift our spirits with the thing that Brits do best, pomp and circumstance. It's going to continue later today. Uh, King Charles is going to go up to Edinburgh for a ceremony of reflection. And then tomorrow, the coffin will be brought back here to Buckingham Palace. And then until the funeral, which is confirmed for September 19th, the Queen will lie in state at Westminster Hall. And the new paid newspapers today, different estimates, but some reporting that up to three quarters mm -hmm. of a million people are expected to file past and pay their respects. Could be hours long queues. So think Princess Diana, uh, think right. the Queen Mother and times it by 10, because this really is a huge moment. Lizzie, for the American audience, for the international audience, explain the symbolism of this day of Scotland and the linkage to England and the rest of Great Britain. Well, it's a real difficult moment for Charles to become king because, of course, the calls for independence have been growing. Uh, but it's not just the union that he's got to hold together. It's also the Commonwealth, which really is a fudge uh, post-empire, the, the family of nations. And so there are also calls for Northern Ireland uh, to break away. So really, this is why you're hearing in Charles's accession speech over the weekend in his uh, speech to Parliament today, uh, his commitment to rule with loyalty uh, and serve to the four nations of the UK and this family of nations that make up the Commonwealth. Because, of course, you're having increasing uh, Republican sentiment in different corners of uh, the globe. And we do see the United Kingdom very much facing regime change with respect to the question about the monarchy as well as the new political regime as well as the new energy regime. And Maria Tadeo, I wanted to touch base with you about what happened over the weekend on the energy front with European leaders as they try to deal with some of these price caps that are being put out there in order to counter Russian pro Russia profiting from this. Has anyone talked about what it would mean if Russia lost the war with Ukraine, if they did retreat, how that would affect the oil and the energy and the gas situation? The answer to that question is no, just purely because everyone here in Brussels but across the European Union were just stunned on Saturday when the Ukrainian army made those gains in Kharkiv. They're able now to push the Russian army back. This was something unexpected as nothing short of a logistics catastrophe uh, for Russia. And I think today, really, the question here is not so much about the energy. This is on everyone's minds. And Wednesday will be a very important day uh, when Ursula von der Leyen speaks okay. before members of the European Parliament. But the real question now for many Europeans is what happens next? Can Ukraine actually win the war? Has the assessment on this country been wrong from day one? But also, what does Vladimir Putin do next? This is an embarrassment for the Russian army. And then the obvious question now is, will he go now from a special operation to full war in Ukraine? And what does that mean? Does it mean conscription? And that could unleash a lot of forces that we haven't seen until now. Maria, does any of this change the fact that we still have a policy response to this war that will endure regardless of the outcome of it? It is very unlikely, even if this war ended tomorrow, that the Europeans would go back to consuming Russian gas in quite the same way, even if it was supplied. Maria, the question I want to ask, and I think has perhaps been neglected by a lot of us, but it's being acknowledged much more so by the Germans, is the persistence of this, the duration of it, the fact that it might not be one winter, it could well be two, perhaps even more. Is that dominating the conversation a little bit more across Europe? 
Yeah, and, 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 and Jonathan, we heard it too from a number of other European leaders. The Belgian Prime Minister, he said, in my view, this is going to be five very difficult years uh, for the European Union. You're talking a complete change of systems. But I do want to say, because we have new data that came out from the Commission today, at the start of the war, the European Union was importing about 40% of gas from the Russian Federation. That number has now gone down to 9%. It is a significant change. It is costing a lot of money, sweat and tears for the Europeans, but what I hear every time behind the scenes, on the record, is that the relationship, the energy relationship between Russia and the European Union is over. This is the end of it until Vladimir Putin decides to change course or perhaps in some way the end of the Russian Federation as we know it. But for the time being, every European official tells me there is no business as usual with Russia. This is done. Maria. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Alongside Lizzie Burden there from Buckingham Palace and from Brussels as well. Germany, according to Chancellor Schultz, quote, has prepared for Russia to largely cut <coughs> off gas supplies because of the war against Ukraine. The worst case outcome at the start of this war, at least on the energy front, has become the base case for a lot of people. And now I think more and more politicians across the, Europe across the European continent speaking more openly about the fact that this could go on way beyond this winter. So if the base case has become the worst case or vice versa, the worst case become the base case, why are natural gas prices in the United Kingdom, in the European Union, falling? This is really an interesting aspect. Natural gas has fallen pretty steadily over the past month. How much are people responding to the worst case? How much are people responding to perhaps not seeing the whites of the winter's eyes? You know who we should start interviewing? A meteorologist. I think that probably that person would be a great market isn't, uh, isn't, isn't participant. Isn't that what we need? Uh, wouldn't a meteorologist be the best? <laughs> That's like a real have, job, the, have the best forecast of the euro right. dollar. You're not kidding. Than, than anyone in the no, effects market. That's You're not true, kidding. but in the United Kingdom, being a meteorologist is like heavy lifting versus, say, if you, if San you Diego. Noticed, if, if you noticed in the UK, there's a phrase that they use here that's not used anywhere else in the world in a weather report. Sunny spells. Oh, so sunny, sunny spells. spells. Yeah. The weather has there, been there fabulous. Will be, there will be sunny spells. In, in this <laughs> sun? Spells of sun. John, I mean, in this... What does that even mean? It means that there's more often rain than sun. in this somber moment. Boy, did King Charles get the weather he was praying for. Absolutely. It's been extraordinary. Coming up, Eric Friedman, U.S. Bank Asset Management Chief Investment Officer. Live from London, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. King Charles III addressed Parliament for the first time today. He told lawmakers he feels, quote, the weight of history which surrounds us following the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Charles is due to travel from Parliament to Edinburgh and accompany the Queen's coffin to St. Giles Cathedral for a service of remembrance. Meanwhile, the UK continues its period of national mourning following the monarch's death. The UK economy recovered more slowly than expected from a slump triggered by an extra public holiday in June. The 0.2% expansion had followed a 0.6% decline in June when gross domestic product was curtailed by an extra day off to mark Queen Elizabeth's Jubilee. Economists had expected growth of 0.3%. Tens of thousands of U.S. railroad workers could be on strike by the end of this week. Negotiators met through the weekend trying to reach a deal with two unions covering some 57,000 engineers and conductors. They're demanding better working conditions. Work stoppages that clog major arteries of the nation's food and energy supplies could pose a potential risk to President Biden and other Democrats. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I support continued increases in the FOMC's policy rate. And based on what I know as of today, I support a significant increase at our next meeting on September 20th and 21st to get the policy rate to a setting that is clearly restricting demand. 
Christopher Waller there, the Federal Reserve Governor speaking at the Institute for Advanced Studies. Not alone, his old colleague and good friend President Bullard saying the same thing. I'm leaning more strongly towards 75 at this point. Those comments going into the weekend. Live from London this morning, good morning. Here's the price action for you. We're lifting this equity market. The first thing I looked at this morning on the Bloomberg Terminal, a snapshot of foreign exchange, the dollar getting absolutely hammered. Euro dollar reclaiming a 101 handle, 101.35. Euro is not alone. It's basically the whole of G10. We're positive on that currency pair, Tom. Nine-tenths of 1%. So there's a snapback for you. That's a, a real snapback bounce. snapback is the right phrase. A snapback is uh, the right phrase. We uh, have you uh, with us in London today. We're thrilled to be here through the week. We are going to continue to look at economics, finance, and investment very quickly now. King Charles, uh, as he travels to Edinburgh, uh, is at his airplane and we'll continue to cover his travels and his sister and brother's travels up to Scotland uh, for a walk of the Royal Mile, an emotional walk of the Royal Mile. The Queen Consort seen there on Bloomberg Radio. We say good morning on perfect weather for the King in his Great Britain. Right now on what we do cover, Eric Friedman with an exceptionally important note with U.S. Uh, bank Asset Management. He is, of course, their chief investment officer. Eric, we sidle up to, I believe, a survey of 8% headline inflation, 6.1% uh, core inflation. And in your research note, you say the tip point, the pivot in the fourth quarter ahead is the 10-year yield at 3.5%. Which way will the 10-year yield cut, and what does it mean for equity investors? Well, Tom, good morning. And we think that three and a half is a level that really has to hold for the equity market to do better. And the reason for that is because the Fed, and we're going to hear obviously more from the Fed next week, and we'll hear more about CPI in the U.S. tomorrow. But the Fed has really shifted its viewpoint from inflation can't just be better than expected. Inflation has to be on an absolute basis lower. And we think that Chair Powell and others have had the chance to reset expectations away from 2%, but they really held firm to say, look, 2% is where CPI and PPI have to kind of come out on a more sustained basis. So, Tom, we think that there's a trap door above 3.5% that would challenge both the bond market and the equity market. So we're still a little cautious. We'd be a little bit, um, let, let's call it, on the sideline as we wait for that 3.5% retest. But, um, again, short-term cautious for us. We were reset at 2 p.m. on September 21st, an important Fed meeting. And then the focus will be on Q3 earnings reported in this fourth quarter. You're in an interesting position on this without being part of a securities research operation at a major Wall Street bank. What do you see for earnings as you distill all of Wall Street's research? It's time we're starting to see a moderation lower, both in this year, even though we only have a couple months left in the period here, to next year's uh, earnings estimates are starting to really have that sign curve effect lower. And it's not been a massive revision, but we still think that there's downside pressure. And really the reason for that, and Lisa did a good job uh, documenting this in tweets over the weekend. If you look at semis in particular, you look at what's happening with both supply chains as well as with enterprise spending, it's showing some signs of moderation. And of course, the big driver of this is what's gonna happen with consumers. We're seeing consumers really reach from a credit perspective. They've been upping a demand for credit. We've seen a little more activity in credit card demand as well. So we think that both the consumer as well as businesses are starting to at the margin roll over. So we do think there's some downward pressure. Uh, we do think the multiple people willing to pay will probably come down a bit as well. So, Eric, just to sort of build out what people are concerned about with the semiconductor industry, we've gotten one semiconductor manufacturer after another come out with some pretty stark warnings about the demand picture, the deterioration. Citigroup analysts came out a couple of weeks ago saying, we continue to believe we are entering the worst semiconductor downturn in a decade, given the inventory build, given the potential recession. Why has that not been priced in to some of the biggest producers of goods that use semiconductors if that lack of demand comes from their products? I think two things, Lisa. So number one is because of the supply chain. There's a, there's a, I think, just a, a guessing game happening right now, not just across semis, but across retail as well, in terms of just what, uh, you know, what that dislodging uh, timetable may look like. And the second thing is people still, I think, have hope that enterprise spending will hang in there. Again, we, there's been so much focus right now on the labor force, but we really need to think about where we're tacking back to as a global economy. We're tacking back to an economy where CFOs are still going to spend marginally, we think, on information technology. Productivity is very important. They're really not going to get that from workers, per se. 
So really emphasizing what they're going to spend time on, we think is going to be uh, tech spending, specifically you know, broader uh, technology infrastructure that, that is manifested in the semi. So I think there's hope still that there is going to be some uh, follow through next year with, uh, with respect to enterprise spending. That's really the reason there's been some degree of hold up in prices right here. Eric, thank you for being with us. Eric Friedman there of US Bank Asset Management. Kit Jukes publishing moments ago, mm. picking up on what many of you have picked up on, the progress being made by Ukraine in the war against Russia and how the FX market and the gas markets are picking up on it as well, the bounce in the euro and the fall away in gas prices, Lisa, which you mentioned a little bit earlier this morning. Well, is it fair to attribute it, though, to the progress that Ukraine is making uh, versus Russia? I, I just wonder, because we've seen the decline in natural gas prices pretty steadily over the past sure. few weeks. So there is a question of whether this is all the bad news being priced in versus optimism about some sort of conclusion. Oh. Nevertheless, it is interesting to raise the question, what is the consequence right. if there is some sort of Russia full withdrawal? Right. I give the Washington Post major credit, a stunning article in the last 12 hours, paragraph by paragraph, John, at the end, out of World War II, just vignette after vignette, village to village. And the FT, with their interview of the defense minister of Ukraine, making clear there's that point, John, where you take too much territory, where you've almost gone too far. Yep. And they're there this morning in London. Now, this was the line from Kit Jukes of Sokgen. The FX market has grabbed hold of the news of Ukrainian progress and its war with Russia with gusto. You yes. see that across the FX market. Yeah. Lisa, I think you're right to question the durability of this move. One thing that's frustrated me over the last couple of months is the way that we say the war, the war. It's the response to the war that has driven gas prices to where they are. And it's not clear to me that even if we resolve some of these issues on the ground militarily, whether we'll actually address and readjust some of the policies that we've actually implemented in response to it. That's the right response, because what we've seen is Germany basically saying, we are not going to go back to Russian natural gas. Do you think that they're going to say, let's restart the uh, Nord Stream 1 and let's rebuild Nord Stream 2 and let's go? No way. You're a dollar right now, 101.38, positive about one full percentage point. Coming up, Gilles Moak, the chief economist at AXA Investment Managers. Live from London with Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Live from London this morning, good morning to you all. We're Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. If you're just waking up, it's a bounce back in this equity market, and that bounce <coughs> continues. After delivering the biggest week of gains on the S&P 500, going back to late July, we add to them on equity futures by about a half of 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, and on the Russell 2000 as well. If you look at the bond market, closed at year-to-date highs, multi-year highs, on a two-year yield on Friday. Yields this morning come back by a couple of basis points, but you'll notice 354 on a two-year, and you'll also notice 330 on tens. And as I said a little bit earlier this morning, that is six straight weeks of 10-year yields climbing after Why pretty much should that everyone trend end? under the sun came on this program, Tom, with the exception of a couple of people, yeah. and said that maybe we've already seen the highs for the year. Well, maybe well, we'll challenge them again in a few <clears> weeks. I get very little value from that. What I want to see is the data, John, and I know we've been talking about it across Bloomberg Radio and TV. I believe there's an inflation report this morning tomorrow, which is the CPI, most important CPI indicator. CPI Tuesday, TK. Yes. And I think CPI Tuesday is an important benchmark here on the way to the 21st. Could we get a snapshot of the FX market as well, just to check in on euro dollar? Because a real bounce this morning is some real weakness in the US dollar. You see that captured by the euro. Euro dollar yeah. pushing higher. One on one handle. It's been a while since we can talk about a one on one handle. One on one thirty three on euro dollar. Positive nine tenths of one percent. So some real dollar weakness out there. Euro strength. Right. TK. <laughs> Getting a little bit better for Europe, relatively speaking? I don't know about that. And sterling from the Liz Truss 114 out to a stronger pound sterling 116.67. We'll continue to monitor the travels of King Charles III from London by jet to Edinburgh. An emotional day with his two brothers and sister and uh, the, the walk on the Royal Mile. Shumawak now joins us for an important briefing. Why is this important? He is one of the great students of continental economics. It matters for America right now with the trading relationships that we have. Gilles, what is the distinctive uncertainty you have in the fourth quarter? You are covering, on a global basis, but you are covering for Europe a continent in war. What is the distinctive uncertainty you face in the fourth quarter? 
Well, you know, Q3, we still had some you know, uh, support from the fact that we reopened our economy a bit later than the US. So, for instance, we had really nice spending on tourism, recreational activities, and so, and so forth. That goes away in, in Q4. And we have this major uncertainty on the price of gas and beyond the price of gas, the availability of gas. So at this juncture, uh, we're still waiting for the details of the EU policy on, on, on the possibility of, of gas rationing and how the electricity market can be can be reformed. Um, and we need to, to know whether or not there will need to be some actual rationing of, of gas, of mm -hmm. energy in general, uh, this winter, because we, we, this could have a drastic impact on GDP if you forced to stop production in a right. number of uh, energy you know, uh, uh, spending companies, you will have a direct impact on GDP. The backdrop here as well over the weekend is electoral tumult in Canada, certainly the election in Sweden, and a, a coming election of some form in Italy as well. Give us the political backdrop as it folds into 2023 and a Europe in recession. Well, Italy is, is important, obviously, because uh, uh, all the polls are saying that uh, you know, the uh, Fratelli d'Italia uh, is probably going to, to win in coalition with, with Lega and, uh, and Forza Italia. Uh, and there are uh, questions, obviously, as to their approach to uh, the uh, commitments of Italy towards towards Europe. To be fair, uh, Giorgia Meloni, the leader of, of Latin Italia, has mellowed a lot on her anti-European rhetorics. So the market is probably you know, uh, ready to, to give some, some leeway to uh, a new government in, in Italy in September. But more generally, um, if you look beyond the elections per se, what we've had so far is a willingness by governments across Europe to accommodate uh, the shock from rising energy prices. Um, with rising interest rates, it's going to be increasingly problematic for these governments to maintain this kind of, of, of fiscal policy. And obviously, this could lead to uh, some you know, uh, uh, political trouble down the road. So we are in sort of a tipping point. For now, governments in general have been able to uh, mitigate a lot of the raw impact of the rise in gas prices that may become more complicated as we get into 2013. Into 2023, sorry. I want to double down on this a little bit because we are here in London as this sort of sea change happens on multiple prongs, whether it's the loss of the Queen, who has reigned for 70 years, or whether it's the loss of negative yields, which had been the base case for more than a decade, or whether it's this energy crisis. And the point that you just made is incredibly important that governments have not realized that the more the ECB hikes rates, the more unable they will be to plug the pain for a lot of the residents. What are you looking at in terms of translating into GDP growth in the euro region as a response to exactly that dynamic that something has to give here? Yes, I mean, basically what's happening is that uh, we are mitigating the current shock. I mean, you can see that everywhere in Europe, including now in the UK, which was hesitant, actually, as to whether they would mitigate the shock. They are. They are going to cap energy prices. So the depth of the recession, which is looming right now, is probably going to end up shallower than what we could have feared just a few months ago. But at the same time, what we're doing is that uh, we are uh, obviously increasing public deficits, increasing public debt. So at some point, and we don't know exactly when, but probably uh, in 2023 or in 2024 at, at the latest, there will need to be some efforts on, uh, 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 on fiscal policy. This will probably have a dampening impact on, on, on domestic demand. So in a way, we are uh, uh, um, just changing the timing of, of the pain. And it makes sense. I mean, we need to deal with the current energy crisis right now, but this will come at a price and the price is likely to be some measure of austerity in 2020, in 2023, or you know, again, at the latest in 2024. There were reports over the weekend, Gilles, of uh, manufacturers in Germany, industrial companies closing down uh, their plants at different times or early, curtailing some of the activity in response to the energy concerns, the energy cost. How much is that going to really affect the reshoring, the uh, desire to try to avoid the interest rate hit and the uh, currency hit that a lot of nations have been feeling? No, I mean it's 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 a it's a big issue for for Germany because um, the industrial uh, specialization of, of Germany 
make them very sensitive to the price of energy beyond the fact that they've made themselves reliant on, on Russian gas. Uh, the very fabric of German industry is quite uh, uh, energy energy intensive. So there are questions actually as to how this model could continue of maintaining on German territory those uh, uh, energy intensive intensive companies. Um, it's not the first time that we have questions as to uh, the German industrial uh, model, their reliance on, on exports. This question is becoming even more crucial uh, today. So uh, what's, what's helping Germany obviously is that they have massive mm -hmm. Uh, policy space. They don't have you know, much of uh, upper public, public debt. They can actually take time to you know, uh, 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 rejig the way their economy is specialized at the moment. But yeah, there right. are questions specifically to Germany at the moment. Jules Moulin, to borrow from Ian Bremer, what is the power of Brussels now, the force of Brussels right now, or is it every nation for itself? Actually, for full standing, I would say that the level of solidarity that has been achieved in Europe in the face of this crisis is, is quite high. I mean, you have, uh, for instance, this principle of European solidarity on gas. It was not obvious, and it has been actually uh, confirmed. Uh, the French president said publicly uh, in a TV address uh, that France uh, the, the winter would actually uh, help Germany with the gas supply uh, this winter. So actually, there's quite a bit of, of solidarity. One of the issues we have, however, is that there's uh, an issue in terms of, of, of leadership. Uh, Mario Draghi is no longer going to be prime minister of Italy. He was playing a big role in shaking things up, if you want, at the European level. Uh, the Chancellor of Germany um, is under massive domestic pressure, probably doesn't have that much time and energy uh, to devote to European matters. And obviously, uh, Emmanuel Macron is not in the same you know, leading position in which he was before uh, the uh, the parliamentary election. So there is a little bit of, 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 of a hesitancy, if you want, uh, in terms of leadership. But at least fourth term being, solidarity is continuing. Um, it's, there's not a lot of signs, actually, that it's, it's every country for itself. We have a few issues with some Eastern countries, Hungary, uh, as, as usual. But by and large, you know, the system holds. Gilles Moak of AXA Investment Manager. Gilles, great to catch up with you, sir. A good moment to catch up as well on the European economy. Can I just say how much of a, a good sign this is? for Governor Bailey next week. So they've had the Bank of England rate decision delayed from Thursday <coughs> to next week, postponed because of the events here in the United Kingdom. To see sterling almost break 114 last week and then print 117 a little bit earlier in the session, I have to admit, at one point last week, Lisa, it felt kind of touch and go for sterling that we might be kind of running into what could be a bit of an issue here with the currency. That bounce back, I don't think it's over, I'm not sure anyone's saying that this morning, but that bounce back has got to be music to the ears of this governor as he sets up for a decision next week. I could agree more just because you're not seeing unmoored declines, unmoored weakness, and people saying it could go to parity and below because there is concern about whether foreign investors are willing to fund Liz Truss's plan. Now people are talking about how interest rate hikes are actually going to be meaningful, the end of the potential end of the war, and some of the optimism that we're hearing throughout the European region. I haven't heard enough about that plan still, have we? I haven't heard a lot about any of this stuff. Obviously, for very good reason, it's not on the front pages in this country, but for the Bank of England governor next week, it's got to be the big issue for him, right? We've got to work out what this means for inflation, what this means for growth, ultimately what it means for policy, try and understand what it means for the bond market, for gilts so at the time that we don't have QE, we have QT, and what it means for this weaker pound over the last several months. How do they deal with hiking rates at a time when this government's going to be spending more with no limit? and with no real input to the GDP from that expenditure. Sterling right now, Tom, 116, 71. It's a better statistic, but when this sadness is over and a new king is anointed, guess what, John? All the problems are still there in, with a they vengeance. They don't go away. With a vengeance. They don't go away. Tom Keane, Lisa Bramitz, Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. King Charles III addressed Parliament for the first time today. He told lawmakers he feels, quote, the weight of history which surrounds us following the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Charles is now on his way to Edinburgh to accompany the Queen's coffin to St. Giles Cathedral for a service of remembrance. Meanwhile, the UK continues its period of national mourning following the monarch's death. 
Russia hit power plants deep behind Ukrainian lines today, causing blackouts across the northeast of the country. Ukraine says more than 30 settlements have suffered Russian missile and airstrikes over the past day. At least two power plants were reportedly hit with precision rockets. Meanwhile, Ukrainian troops are continuing to advance in an offensive that has reversed months of Moscow's advances. Chinese President Xi Jinping will make state visits to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan this week, his first trip abroad since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Beijing says Xi will attend a leader summit of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Russia announced last week that Xi will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the summit as Moscow seeks to bolster ties with Beijing. The U.S. healthcare system has received failing marks. A new poll from the Associated Press and NORC Center for Public Affairs Research, it shows that fewer than half of Americans surveyed say healthcare is generally handled well. Only 12% say it's handled extremely or very well. Even lower marks were given for the cost of prescription drug, drugs, the quality of care at nursing homes, and how mental health care is handled. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quid Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The constraints revealed by the pandemic are likely to be with us for some time, perpetuating imbalances, contributing to inflation, and likely requiring a sustained policy response. I'll also argue that constraints continue to bind policy. Can we thank Esther George, the Kansas City Fed president, for her service to the Kansas City Fed, Tom, and also her immense hospitality in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Wasn't she brilliant? I, she was brilliant. I will state that. And we were making light humor about it, about her new puppy, which was an exit puppy for her from the Kansas City Fed named Pivot. But, John, I'm going to state this as clearly as I can. Jackson Hole was the greatest, most unaffected reality of diversity of guests I've ever seen in economics. She and the Kansas City Fed absolutely nailed an eclectic, informative set of guests. It was only a number of Fridays nailed ago. It. Only a number of Fridays ago, and Lisa, already some people are questioning the communication that we got a number of Fridays ago. What did Jonathan Gollum at Credit Suisse say to us on Friday? <laughs> I reviewed that interview with John. Me too. He said, OK, but they're not going to tell you what they're actually going to do next yeah. year, are they? They're telling you one thing, but I'm telling you they're going to do something else. He said that it was game theory, right? You need the markets to move in a certain way to work for them. So basically, you just basically, you know, you can ignore them because you can figure that they just want to move the markets enough and then they will continue to reverse course and lower rates. And this is actually hey. the bull case for a lot of equities. He's not alone with this. And maybe he's right, Tom. We've got equity futures up another half of 1% this Monday morning. A weaker dollar and yields have yeah, been higher. They stabilized just a little bit so far this morning. I bet on what we're going to see on inflation tomorrow, and that's what we're focused on with the markets today, with the weaker dollar sterling out to a 116. Round that up, a 117 level as well. We continue to monitor the travels of King Charles, his two brothers and sister this morning to Edinburgh. Right now, and this is exquisitely timed, we had to book her months in advance. She's so difficult to get. Professor Norman, Julie Norman, is co-director of UCL Center on U.S. Politics, but far more is acclaimed for study of terrorism and war unraveling. And that's certainly what we have seen uh, here over the weekend. I commend you the, po the Washington Post article, which paragraph by paragraph shows the brutality of the present war. Dr. Norman, how bad is it? Well, Tom, we know that the war has just been grueling throughout the whole summer. So I think it's really notable today that headlines are actually back focused on it. And of mm -hmm. course, that's because of the just extremely impressive Ukraine offensive that managed to retake. It's looking like about 1,500 square miles in just a matter of a number of days. Huge boost of morale for Ukrainians, even despite the devastation that we've seen left behind right. in the villages, as you mentioned. To take the Mideast experience, which you're expert on, I believe when the Allies went across North Africa, a guy named Rommel pushed back from time to time. Do the Russians have the capability to push back, as we saw from the Defense Secretary of Ukraine and the FT this weekend? 
It's an important point, Tom, because as much excitement and I think uh, warranted that there is for Ukraine this weekend, it, uh, we should be cautious with it as well. Um, you know, you, uh, Russia still controls about 20 percent of the country. They still are very strong in the south. They control the main uh, cities in the south, the land bridge to, uh, to Crimea. And most importantly, they still have a lot of wild cards up their sleeve in terms of both conventional and, conven and unconventional warfare that uh, we know Putin, um, you know, is, is still a possibility that he could still use. Here. Can you think of a resolution of this war that leads to a recalculation of what's going to happen with energy supplies this winter? I ask that question, Julie, because there's a clear market reaction to today where gas prices are lower, the euro is stronger. Does it change anything for the energy crisis that we've got to work through this winter? Yeah, it's a great question because it changes the narrative right now in the moment, even though, again, the course of the war is still likely to be very long and very prolonged and very difficult for Ukraine. So obviously this week we're still seeing EU leaders trying to decide on what they're going to do about this energy crisis. I don't see what happened over the weekend, uh, you know, ameliorating all these concerns anytime soon, even though the markets are responding. So it was good news for Ukraine in the sense that I think they'll get a bit more sympathy and support from some uh, European allies who may have been um, questioning policies moving forward. But in reality, in the long run, these are still going to be issues we're dealing with for quite a long time. This is humiliating for Vladimir Putin. This is not what he wants to have happened. How does he try to save face and how potentially dangerous is that response? Yeah, well, this is obviously the concern that we never know what Putin is going to do next. We do know that when Putin feels backed into a corner or feels humiliated, that's often when uh, things are the most risky and the most tense. So I think there's a lot of question marks as to what Putin may do. We've already seen him respond in terms of targeting a civilian infrastructure, so cutting off power and water supplies to civilian areas in the province where uh, gains were made. So we can expect more of that, but even uh, perhaps even more, um, more grim kind of uh, in, uh, interventions as well. And so I would say nothing's off the table when it comes to Putin. Judy, where this president in the United States has had success, a lot of success, is keeping all the European nations on side, one voice to address what's happening in Ukraine. Are you seeing any signs of cracks around that story within respective electorates across the continent at the moment? Yeah, Biden and the Biden administration has been so focused on that from the start and even before the start of this conflict. And I think that will continue to be their priority. In reality, though, I think Biden has a little bit less leverage with EU countries now going into this energy crisis, going into very likely recessions that are just simply going to affect Europe a bit differently than the United States. I don't think we're seeing cracks just yet, but I think we're hearing what are very uh, realistic, pragmatic conversations about what kinds of policies can actually address this energy crisis, what that means for the Ukraine conflict at the same time. Is there one country you're more worried about than, than others? Is there one that jumps out to you at the moment? Oh, I would say there's different countries with concerns. I think about 10 countries are pushing back at like the, the oil cap and the gas cap, for example. Um, I think we heard from an earlier commentator, you know, Italy's leadership is in flux right now and yeah. Draghi had been very um, firm and a very important voice in the Ukraine conflict up till now. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching Italy to see how they play things moving forward. You're not alone. Julie, it's great to see you in person. Thank as you. Well. Thank you. Julie Norman there of UCR Center on U.S. politics. Lisa, I think that was your number one focus as well over the last few months or so. Are we starting to see some cracks emerge? Julie mentioned Italy. I think you're on the same page. Italy showing there was a uh, poll that came out showing that more than half of the respondents were against some of the caps, were against some of the sanctions on Russia, saying it's hurting the EU and the U.S. more than it is hurting Russia. And this has been the big concern, right? You see Russia making money, and you see the EU struggling in the face of potentially an energy crisis. Does reality bite, Tom, later this winter? We joked in the last <coughs> hour about the need to speak to a meteorologist about the future in Europe, but in all joke. seriousness, that's what it comes down to. How cold is this winter going to be? How brutal will it be? And how much support will these politicians have to maintain the current energy policy they have? When you see the political pressures over the weekend ongoing in Sweden, what may come in Italy, is it about a cold winter or is it even about one week? Politically, how, what's the difference between a one-week cold in Poland and a cold winter? I don't sure. think there's a difference. But Tom, a cold winter or two or three? Or four, That's another or five. issue. And the Belgians, the Belgian, I keep going back to this, the Belgian Prime Minister seems to be the only one talking about that. The prospect that this could go well, on way beyond one winter, maybe even many, many more. I, I would suggest in the Monday of next week there's a distraction as, as European leaders travel to London for the funeral of the sure. Queen. After that, with a vengeance, we may catch up with this debate. You said it, Tom, this hour. The problems do not go away. They don't go away. They're going to be here with a vengeance Tuesday next week.
Bob Miller's going to join us from BlackRock very shortly. Looking forward to that conversation with Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures bouncing back slightly positive from London. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Central banks have doubled down on what they've said. We've seen such a surge in inflation that the European Central Bank, like the US Fed, has decided it needs to be seen as fighting inflation. The Fed follows monetary policy based on what's best for the United States, and the consequences of the rest of the world are the consequences for the rest of the world. The elephant in the room is global growth, and that's the elephant in the room of the euro. It's hard to say that we're done with the high prices and how that's going to affect people. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keene. Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Global leaders will descend on this country. A week from today, they will pay tribute to Queen Elizabeth. Their problems will not go away. Live from London, for our audience worldwide, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Tom, you've said it all morning. Their problems will not go away. They will not go away. The pageantry continues today uh, for... Uh, Queen Elizabeth. We can get to that in a moment, John. But the problems here center around the inflation picture, which we'll see in the United States tomorrow. But so much more in complexity. And I'll say to you, John, going down the embankment in the Thames and looking over to St. Thomas, where the Prime Minister Johnson was fighting for his life of COVID, that is just one issue for the United Kingdom. Their health system is in crisis. And then, Lisa, on to Ukraine, where Ukrainians are fighting for their lives. And real signs of progress over the weekend. With uh, accounts of Russian soldiers fleeing Ukrainian areas that they had previously captured, getting pushed out as Ukraine uh, reportedly is reclaiming that land with the help of some of the U.S. weapon systems and the weapon systems of allies. How much though does this really change the backdrop of the energy crisis that's yeah. facing uh, Europe this winter? John, for an America waking up this morning, of course, on London time, five hours uh, a difference this morning, an extraordinary moment. I can't say enough about the importance of Westminster Hall, uh, where the Queen's coffin will rest uh, briefly. Uh, the worthies gathering today, including former Prime Minister Johnson and others, to hear a somber speech from King Charles as he speaks to the government of this nation. The symbolism there is extraordinary. We're going to run through the play-by-play -play the day ahead, the week ahead, the words of the King early this morning. I cannot help but feel the weight of history. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier this morning, I think we all feel that over the weekend, and we will do through the next week as well. I'm going to run through the markets for you. Lisa's going to go through the day ahead. I want to start with equity futures because we just delivered a really decent weekly gain on the S&P 500, the best weekly gain going back to late July. Equity futures right now are positive four-tenths of 1% 1 on the S&P. Yields are just a little bit lower by two basis points at 328.88. But one thing you will notice, front and centre, Bramo, is that dollar weakness out there right now? Euro dollar, 10140, that currency pair, positive, one full percentage point. And you're pointing out it's not just the dollar versus the euro, it's also the dollar versus everything else, because there is this feeling that perhaps the world is going to recover, perhaps insert your narrative here. The euro, though, definitely catching people's eyes at a time of great change. And uh, you said that we'd walk through the play-by-play. -play. Here's the latest that we're hearing as uh, King Charles III heads to Edinburgh. He's going to arrive evidently at 12.45 a.m. Uh, local time, 7.45 Eastern. And then he is going to join in the procession behind the coffin of his late mother starting around 9.35 Eastern. That is uh, 2.35 p.m. local time. I'm heading to St. Giles Cathedral. We'll be really catching up with you throughout the day about the proceedings. Then, of course, at 8 a.m. Eastern, we are going to be hearing from Isabel Schnabel of the ECB. She's giving welcoming remarks at the 7th Annual ECB Research Conference in Frankfurt. And this does follow some hawkish comments over the weekend from a number of ECB officials, including Bundesbank President Joachim Nagel. Some people saying this is part of the reason why you are seeing Euro strength is because there is a reiteration of the willingness to hike rates again after mm -hmm. the biggest ever rate hike by the ECB. And then at 12 p.m., a focus on the U.S. and some of the food supplies, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, with the World Agricultural Supply and Demand September report. How much is there the support 
of the weather and of growing things at a time when food prices very much catching people's attentions when they go to grocery stores. Two headlines that stick out this morning after reports over the weekend that we've seen progress in Ukraine, Lisa. Here's one from Chancellor Schultz reiterating support for Ukraine, quote, for as long as it takes. And this from the Russians a little bit earlier this morning, this from the Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, who said he sees no prospects for talks with Ukraine now. And Lisa, I think we all need an update on what's happening here because certainly for some people, they're attributing the move in the euro, stronger euro this morning, the move in gas prices in Europe lower to the events over the weekend. If there is progress, what does it look like if you do not see a Russia that is willing to retreat, that is willing to talk and come to some sort of agreement, especially when we were just talking to Julie Norman and she said the big fear is that we have a Vladimir Putin who is unpredictable and does not want to lose face. So what is his response going to be and how does that really shake the status quo? A team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in D.C. Maria Tadeo over in Brussels. Maria, can we start there? What have you heard about developments over the weekend in Ukraine and what does it mean for policymakers in your world in Brussels? Look, I think there's two things. One is European leaders were stunned by just how quick but also effective this operation from the Ukrainian army was on Saturday. And when you look at just how big this country is, the amount of land that they've been able now to win back is enormous. You always have to look at the map to figure out just how significant uh, this is. These aren't just tiny villages. This is a significant amount of land. For the Ukrainians, it also validates their theory that their army is competitive it is well trained it has been since Crimea and that heavy weapons make all the difference on the battleground so I will expect that from now on they will push the Europeans not so much the United States because they have provided a lot of the weapons but the Europeans to put more weapons in their hands now when it comes to the Russians the big question today in Europe is what will Vladimir Putin do and I think the key here is does it get to a point where he goes from special operation to war and war means conscription and I think we all can agree there's a huge difference between if you're a Russian to watch a war like it's reality TV to being called <clears throat> to go on the battlefield against an army that has proven very effective. Uh, Maria I, I, I look at the news over the weekend in the pregnant question I'm sure for the uh, Defense Department in the United States is how do you link the Ukrainian effort in the north to a Ukrainian effort down south towards the Black Sea. Is that even feasible now? Well, Tom, at this point, I think if you look at just how quick and just how efficient this was, there is this thinking that they can move down. Of course, the problem is, is that Russia has retreated and has also pulled down some of the troops to regroup. And what they say is not a defeat, but it's just regrouping to protect some of the areas that they had already conquered. Can you imagine the embarrassment for Vladimir Putin if the Russians, excuse me, if the Ukrainians do manage to get back to areas like Mariupol? At that point, the options for Vladimir Putin would get very narrow. He needs to save face some way. But the Ukrainian army, and I think that post yesterday by Vladimir Zelensky on Telegram saying, we will liberate everything. Our army is not going to stop. We'd rather starve, not have heat and not have electricity, but have our country back. This is everything that we're aiming off. Also shows that the Ukrainians at this point have no incentive to stop. They will continue if they have the weapons. And Marie, this really brings us to the United States, which has been supplying a lot of those weapons and has been expressing support for Ukraine. How much and how far does that support go of the European nations that are struggling with a natural gas crisis? They did talk to the United States about possibly capping the price that people pay <coughs> Russia in order to get their gas or their, their, their oil, I should say. But what else are they doing? What else is in the works to provide natural gas to Europe? So two things, and first on the natural gas front, this summer, I, no one's really talked about it, but the fact is U.S. Li liquefied natural gas supplies to Europe have been bigger than the Russian supplies via pipeline. This is something that has never happened in the world. This is the first time on record. So you already you have seen the United States sending more LNG over to Europe, which of course is going to be more expensive for Europe. And logistically, it's not how Europe is placed, but this is the situation they're in. And what we've seen for months, and my reporting on this goes back to early this year, you have U.S. officials traveling around the world well before the war started, well before Ukraine thought 
this was even possible, making sure they were talking to huge LNG producers like Qatar to if there was an event that Russia was going to ratchet back this natural gas that they could get to Europe. And what you're going to see is a continuation of that. I would also say on the defense front, we heard from Senator Mark Warner over the weekend talking to CNN State of the Union on the Sunday shows saying that it's not just the military equipment, but it's the U.S. and the U.K. intelligence that is also helping Ukraine. That, of course, is going to continue. And then the White House asking Congress to add in nearly $12 uh, billion more in terms of help for Ukraine when they work out this stopgap funding measure. MH, thank you. Over in Washington, D.C., alongside Maria Tadeo in Brussels, the team back together on the big event taking place in Ukraine. The war continues. Progress, real progress, we're told, over the weekend. Here's some headlines for you from the Prime Minister's spokesperson. This is Liz Truss's spokesman, Max Blaine, briefing reporters at the moment. They're still planning to hold a fiscal event later this month. Then we're all ears on how big that fiscal package will actually be. And, of course, we don't know because you need to basically guess where gas prices are going to be to work that out. The plan for households will take effect at least on October 1st. The energy plan for businesses is still being worked on. And this is the reality of the moment in the UK. This is how we started this programme. We will pause in this country for a week. Global leaders will descend on the capital. They will all pause and pay tribute to this Queen. These problems still need to be addressed. And the number one issue in this country, particularly over the last week, has been the unveiling of massive fiscal intervention, the details of which still need to be ironed out, still need to understand how it's costed. How do you cost something that is ultimately uncapped, incredibly difficult, almost impossible? Right. And it's incredibly difficult when you're not having meetings to hash it out in public. You imagine that behind closed doors, they are trying to figure this out if it's going into effect October 1st. But then what's the response in the bond market? I believe today is a market holiday in the United Kingdom. When it reopens, what kind of response do you get in guilt yields as you look at possible plans that are going to be relatively unvetted if they get unrolled October 1st? Some details we understand, Tom, for next Monday that markets will be shut. It will be a bank holiday for the funeral and we've finally got a date for that. It's a week from today. It is a week from today with world leaders attending. Mr. Biden, I believe, last evening confirming that he will attend with Dr. Jill Biden. Sterling, just a bit stronger here, by three quarters of one percent against the dollar. Cable 116.74. Very briefly, earlier on today, 117 after threatening to break 114 at one point last week. Coming up, Bob Miller of BlackRock. Looking forward to that with Lisa Bramett and Tom Keane. I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. King Charles III is vowing to uphold parliamentary democracy and follow what he called the selfless duty of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. Addressing Parliament today, the king said he felt, quote, the weight of history surround him. Charles now heads to Scotland, where he'll lead a procession carrying the queen's coffin through Edinburgh. Tens of thousands of U.S. railroad workers could be on strike by the end of this week. Negotiators met through the weekend trying to reach a deal with two unions, covering some 57,000 engineers and conductors. They're demanding better working conditions. Work stoppages that clog major arteries of the nation's food and energy supplies could pose a potential risk to President Biden and other Democrats. Japan is reportedly easing some COVID-era restrictions. FNN says the country is planning to end its daily limit on arrivals from overseas visitors. Japan is also said to be considering allowing foreign visitors to book trips directly and travel freely within the country. The rules are expected to apply to travelers who've had three vaccine shots or can provide negative test results. Twitter is saying no to Elon Musk's latest effort to cancel his agreement to buy the social media network. Twitter says Musk's latest move is, quote, invalid and wrongful. That's according to a filing today. The billionaire says the company treatment of a whistleblower gave him another reason to walk away from that $44 billion deal. It's his third attempt to withdraw his offer. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. remarkable that people were saying that the dollar's day was passed uh, not very long ago, uh, given its current strength. And 
My guess is that there's room for this to continue. Do you think that might have been aimed at someone over at Yale? I'm just asking. Uh, just, that, just for that a was, friend. That was Larry Summers, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary. <clears throat> it had that kind of feel, Tom, that it might have been directed I, at someone over at Yale. We spoke to Dr. Laren the other day of the huge emotion of his representation of the Queen of England to University of Cambridge, and we stayed on that theme. I'm sorry, Summers, oh, Larian, and the rest of them, they get a massive victory lap here. Without a, a doubt. correlation on to what we've seen in strong dollar. People like Mark McCormick. People like HSBC, sure. FX, the late David Bloom, who's no longer with him. You know, I'm sorry. These people nailed it. Wells Fargo as well. Yeah. I was talking about another school in... I know. We all you know, know exactly in, who you're in talking America. about. In America. Who? Stephen Roach. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, he's, he's another one. Yeah. He's another oh, yeah. one. Was, yeah. Who else I, were you I've talking about? I've forgotten about him. Just the other people at Yale who might have got it wrong in the U.S. dollar. Anyway, um, futures, they're positive on the S&P 500. <clears throat> they're up a little bit, Tom, in the equity market. Nice got a bounce here. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I forgot about Stephen. Well, totally. who are you talking about? Did he, what, what was his call on the dollar? Weak, weak dollar. Weak, weak, Very like weak dollar. collapse yeah, weak yeah. dollar. Collapse weak, yeah. Okay, it's weaker today at least. You're a dollar one one thirty two. Tom, that currency pair up nine tenths of one percent. I, I big think bounce. Th th it's a big bounce, and there's an adjustment here, but it goes into what we have here, which is the data dependency of the various central banks, including now the Bank of England meeting the day after at the Fed, and also the data dependencies of fixed income professionals. One is Bob Miller, head of America's fundamental fixed income, truly with decades of experience. Bob Miller, what is the symbolism if the Lehman Barclays Bloomberg total return aggregate index breaks down? to new lower price and higher yield. How do you redefine the bear market if we get that technical breakdown? Well, good morning, Tom. I hope all of you are well. It's good to be with you. Um, look, I, 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 we, we think that yields are now reasonable. Uh, so yes, they can, you know, prices can go down and yields can go higher from here. But, but we're in the range of reasonable. Fixed income offers you know, some, some reasonably attractive opportunities today after, uh, for the first time since 2018, um, and, and certainly after the period of, of no opportunity two years ago and, and a year ago. So you can build a high quality portfolio that has a four to five percent yield, including treasuries, you know, high quality credit, even high quality, add some high quality, high yield in the eight and a half to nine percent range. You can build a pretty attractive portfolio for, for the first time in years and specifically in U.S. fixed income. And, and we think that that's, uh, that's something that investors ought to be thinking about for the next year. No doubt things have been ugly this year. And, and there's no near-term relief in sight. But valuations matter, and, and these valuations look, look reasonable to us. They look reasonable compared perhaps to a year ago. They won't necessarily look as reasonable in a year if 10-year Treasury yields are 5 percent, where some people are suggesting they could be. Are you in the camp that says that we have seen peak yields on 10-year or that we're close to it, even as we do see them start to climb and push up against and test some of the highs that we've seen of the cycle? Yeah, at least I don't know if we've seen the peak, but but I think we're close, meaning because we're in the camp that inflation is going to decelerate, growth is going to decelerate. I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's really important to keep in mind the magnitude of the financial conditions tightening that the Fed has engineered in just six months' time. They're going to raise rates by another 75, most likely, in, in less than two weeks' time, pushing the funds rate to three. That's in a six-month period of time, 300 basis points off zero. 600 basis points annualized, right? This, this is not an insignificant move. It's a, it's a meaningful move, and, and it takes time, right? The, the famous long and variable lags. It takes time for policy adjustments, easing and tightening, to work their way through all of the cracks in the economy. It's coming. I think it'll be, it'll be very unlikely that we, we look up in three to six months' time and growth and inflation haven't slowed by a sufficient amount that the Fed is probably able to pause with rates around 4% and just sit there for a while. So in order to get a 5% tenure on a one-year horizon, wow. a lot of things have to go wrong, right? I just, uh, that just may, maybe, it could be, but, but a lot of things already have gone wrong, and I think it's, it's a little dangerous to extrapolate the last nine months into the next nine months without considering what's happening two financial conditions in the U.S. economy. They are tighter. <clears throat>
Yeah, although you do still see the consumer having some strength, particularly with oil prices or at least gasoline prices coming down a bit. Have we fully taken into account the fact that Europe has also moved away from negative yielding regime with the biggest ever rate hike at the, at the ECB meeting last week and is poised to do more, that there is a cohesive and global synchronized rate hiking cycle that we really haven't seen in modern history? Yeah, it's a great point. And, and it would, I, I would argue that that adds to the, the reality of financial conditions tightening in a lot of different places, not just the United States. And that will ultimately have a delayed, but, a, but likely a real impact on growth and inflation over the next year or two. Keep in mind, there's one central bank that, that isn't participating that we think will, will likely be forced to by their own inflation dynamics in Japan sometime over the next six to nine months. We wouldn't be at all surprised to see the yield curve control um, program that's been in place for some time, um, at a minimum, adjusted slightly, if not adjusted by you know, a reasonable amount. Hey, Bob, we've got to pick up on that. Final question. What does that mean? And how would the rest of the global bond market respond to a move like that? Yeah, so Jonathan, great question. That, that, that's where, like, if you asked me what's the scenario where the question Lisa mentioned about a 5% Treasury yield, what, what's, this, what's the scenario where that's a reality? It's either, it's either just unbelievably persistently high inflation um, that the Fed cannot get under control, so the front end is likely at 5, if not higher, or it's some resumption of global term premium by the, you know, the ECB not only, not only um, turning off QE, but perhaps even pursuing some balance sheet runoff, and importantly, the Bank of Japan abandoning yield curve control. I think all of that, each one of those is individually pretty, pretty low odds, but, but that is the scenario where if you want to get really bearish on bonds, I think you've got to have something like that in mind. Hey, Bob, thank you. Bob Miller there of BlackRock. Brilliant. Great place to leave it and pick up on that and continue the conversation. If you think about the global bond market over the last decade or so, Tom, there's been two very heavy anchors just weighing down yields. Right. One was Europe, the other was Japan. We've cut the cord, we've cut the line on Europe. Is Japan next? Well, that's a shock, and it's the old phrase, expect the unexpected, and certainly that's not priced in at right now. And that would take, let's talk about a snapback in yen if we Can were to see that. Oof. Ten big figures. <laughs> I'm not going to predict, but maybe it's that kind of ginormous move. 3.30 right now on the U.S. 10-year. Kenny Kaminsky of Alpha Simplex joining us up next from London. This is Bloomberg. Touchdown at Edinburgh Airport, King Charles III. A little bit later this morning after that, he'll have an audience with the Scottish First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon. Tom, before he gets there, I understand there will be an arrival and inspection of the Guard of Honour at the Palace of Holyrood House, Scotland. So that's the next phase of all of this, Tom, as we work our way through to the funeral this time next week. Many, including in America, will say, what's the why here, the focus on Scotland, besides the Queen's immense affection for her mother, the Queen Mother's heritage of Scotland. And the answer is, all of this is the imagery as King Charles will visit the different parts of the United Kingdom, John, that are separate from England. Britain is not England, is it? There's another part of this as well, Tom. We have to remember this. As a member of the media, we'd been thinking of what was called Operation London Bridge. And that was for if the late Queen had died here in England, in London, at Buckingham Palace, or perhaps even at Windsor. She, of course, stayed through the summer in Balmoral, the royal family's Scottish holiday home, and that was Operation Unicorn. This was an mm -hmm. unexpected development. So all these things you're seeing right. centred around Scotland as we go through the next phase of bringing the Queen back towards London, Tom. This is why. This was oh. part of this sequence that was unexpected when all this planning has been done. And this planning has been in place for a long, long time. And the unexpected will be the emotion this morning. Everyone, of course, is covering this worldwide, folks. And on radio and television, Lisa, John and I are going to try to give you perspective within the market coverage that we 
We do. John, I can't emphasize enough the symbolism that we will see in the next two hours from King Charles III moving from the palace up the Royal Mile. I couldn't agree with you more, Tom. We've got to pick up on some of the price action as well, so allow me to go through some of the equity market movements this morning. And good morning to you all in New York. It's now good afternoon from London. Equity futures up a half of 1% on the S&P 500. As we wait for the opening bell in New York City, a couple of hours away, equities elevated, yields lower by a couple of basis points the 329.45 dollar weakness is a real story today euro strength euro dollar 101.33 that currency pair positive nine tenths of one percent with some single names we can head over to new york now and catch up with Kriti gupta hey Kriti. yeah good morning john well as you were talking about in the uh, kind of sphere of the broader market with that background here you do have twitter shares actually lower one of your underperformers this morning down to the tune of one percent remember they do have that shareholder vote tomorrow as uh, the Legal battle with Elon Musk continues. He has for a third time tried to say he needs to withdraw out of the deal. Twitter saying that his claims, while well, they are invalid. Nevertheless, those shares down to the tune of 1%. Following cryptocurrencies, though, Riot Blockchain sharing in some of that glory, up about 3% on the day. But to me, I think the real macro story here is going to be railroad strikes. One, they're supposed to start as soon as Friday and could actually increase those supply chain woes across the country. Think Chicago, Kansas City, Fort Worth, Texas. Right now, the assumption here is that Joe Biden, the Labor Transport Secretary Marty Walsh as well is going to hop in and somehow push them back as they have earlier in his term. Nevertheless, Union Pacific shares uh, and the other railroads, I should say, to, trading a little bit higher to the tune of almost 2%. Let's get to the other major macro story, and that, of course, is going to be the chip sector. An expectation here in the market that President Biden is actually going to broaden some of the uh, restrictions when it comes to exporting <clears throat> chips to China. He's already tried to do this a little bit uh, when it comes to specific uh, technology. Now he's going to broaden it to other artificial intelligence as well. So on the expectation of that move, you have the likes of NVIDIA, advanced micro devices, and even Intel all up on the day. Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate that. We say good morning to you from London as we look, as John mentioned, of equity markets doing better than good. And maybe it is a second rally off of what we saw in the horror of middle of June. Katie Kaminsky joins now. It's been a joy to speak to her chief research strategist at Alpha Simplex about trend, because she, off of Andrew Lowe at MIT, is a slave to trend, is full disclosure, I am too. Katie, what is the trend now, and is the trend different than what we saw in the last two weeks of June? Yes, I mean, I think we've seen the short bond signals as well as long um, long positioning in dollar be very dominant recently. But in the last two weeks, we've really seen an influx of risk on behavior, a lot of buying pressure, particularly in the equity sector. And this is somewhat of an indication that people are getting optimistic. They're ready to put money back in the market. But the question is going to be, is it too early? That's the question that City's asking. This is what Andrew Hollenhorst and the team had to say this morning. They published just moments ago. I'll read through it. Despite the pricing in of hikes, risk on prevails. The message at Jackson Hole was clear. The Fed will lean against looser financial conditions until inflation has convincingly slowed. The team over at City go on to say, meaning the Fed will be incentivized to push against the nascent risk rally. Do you agree with that, Katie? I do agree with it, but I also think it could take longer than people expect. And the fact that the Fed is remaining steady is they're setting a signal that they're thinking a little differently than the market. And I think we've been the most surprised to see that the market is more optimistic than Fed commentary. And that suggests that there's perhaps maybe a little bit more that we need to think about going forward and that we might see a little bit of reversion. We'll see what the CPI looks like today. But, you know, you're going to have to see how winter unfolds and how we handle some of these energy issues and other problems. Uh, we haven't even really seen QT yet. So I think it's going to take time to know, but I'm a little bit less optimistic than the market. And Katie, John was talking earlier about how we should just interview with meteorologists all day. And that might be as good as interviewing prognosticators on the market because that might be what determines the market. So what is the bond response? What is the stock response to a, a, a really cold winter, one in which the energy shortfall becomes more acute? I mean, this is a serious issue because if you see people dealing with higher interest rates in terms of their payments, and you're also seeing people dealing with higher costs, it could really be a difficult situation, particularly for Europe. Um, and so I think people really need to think about looking at those prices as we roll into the winter season. We're just now starting to move towards December contracts and farther out in the curve. So I do agree with John that, you know, it's really going to depend on how we weather uh, the winter. Um, 
as, as the price pressure is real. Katie, we're speaking with you after you got a 38% gain in Alpha Simplex's main fund as a result of selling short bonds, something that hasn't worked for years. At what point do you double down on that short position at a time where you think the market's getting it wrong and underestimating the Fed's resolve? So I think one thing to know about trend following is what we do is follow trends. And the truth is that the market, particularly in really difficult environments, is often a better bastion of information than one individual or any one particular view. And so what we've seen now, which is kind of why I'm saying it's surprising, is that short bond trends are still there. That positioning is still very strong in the data. And we could definitely see, even though rates are reasonable, them becoming more unreasonable right. in the short term. Can you correlate short bond, bond price down, yield up into an equity bet on trend? Yes, I mean, as once we see that things have leveled out, I think I've always said that this isn't an equity story, it's a bond story. So once we see that bonds have stabilized and we have a much more healthy curve and more of a risk premium out in the curve, so we see much more of a steeper curve, I would think that that's really sort of a risk on signal that we can all start to think about those premiums as opposed to the potential destruction of uh, rate rises. Because we all forget, even though it's better going forward, the bonds we right. own now really take a hit. Okay. And we all felt that this year. Katie, let's go mathy here. We're doing this on a Monday. We can go math Monday here as well. Is the disinversion of the curve important or is it the first derivative rate of change of said disinversion? For me, it's much more the inversion of the curve that's going to matter. I mean, that tells us something about the disparity between what we're thinking about short-term rates and long-term rates. And if you look empirically at signals in terms of trend and direction of bonds, you see that bonds have tended to fall when the curve is more inverted. And thus, if we continue to see that inversion signal, we're going to see that there's some sort of bearish view on bonds until we can kind of see that longer-term risk premium, that steep um, really be an issue. So I'd say first derivative. <laughs> Katie Kaminsky, thank you. Over at Alpha Simplex on the latest in the bond market. Built on a conversation we had with Bob Miller of BlackRock about 10, 15 minutes or so ago. <clears throat> Bob Miller, Lisa, very keen to point out the Bank of Japan. And I brought up the fact, and a lot of people would go along with this, I'm sure, that the two anchors around the global bond market for the last at least 10 years has been the ECB and the BOJ both with QE and negative rates, deeply negative interest rates over in Japan, weighing down yields. We're unwinding that process at the ECB, first with a rather large rate hike in the last week or so. QT could be the next step. What we're all waiting to see happen is whether the BOJ is the next to capitulate here because they're running not just <clears throat> very, very low interest rates, but also keeping a lid, a cap, on yields in the JGB market. Over the weekend, a number of Japanese officials came out and raised concerns once again on <clears throat> the yen and the devaluation they have seen and the concern about importing the wrong kind of inflation. At what point do some of the voices get together and kind of pressure to become a scenario, just like you say, um, where they have to abandon that cash? Johnny, I'll come here. You can do it off the Bloomberg very quickly on a weekly chart. Dollar yen, if you get a push to uh, negative two standard deviation, strong yen is 16 big figures. Do you find it interesting 16. that on a day where everything else is really rallying hard against the US dollar, the euro, sterling, that the yen is doing nothing? Uh, yeah, dollar not, yen's unchanged uh, at 142.55. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. It's just it, yeah. It's there. It is euro stronger, yen not helping out. A euro yen at 144.46 shows that. But I, 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 to me, it's a, a little bit of noise waiting for Tuesday's US Inflation report. It's CPI Tuesday. It's in CPI Tuesday. CPI Tuesday, Lisa, just around the in corner. In London. Well, look, right now, the Japanese yen is not correlated in the same way because they are not playing by the same playbook that everybody else is. So at what point do they decide to play along at a time when they are basically facing off the same inflationary pressures that everybody else is? And frankly, an energy shortage, as some people say, is pretty significant as well. Vasily Serebrikov of UBS is going to weigh in on some of this stuff in about five minutes or so. We're also going to keep following King Charles III, who we understand has touched down in Edinburgh. He will disembark the plane very, very shortly and make his way, Tom, to an audience with the First Minister. And a walk Nicholas up to Sturgeon, Royal Mile. A little bit later, yes. Lisa?
I was just gonna do a mea culpa. I said Edinburgh before, and it's Edinburgh. I just okay. keep thinking, you know, okay. it's these things happen. And there's the king right now, King Charles III, touching down in Edinburgh, Scotland. From London, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world, with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia hid power plants deep behind Ukrainian lines today, causing blackouts across the northeast of the country. Ukraine says more than 30 settlements have suffered Russian missile and airstrikes over the past day. At least two power plants were reportedly hit with precision rockets. Meanwhile, Ukrainian troops are continuing to advance in an offensive that has reversed months of Moscow's advances. The UK economy recovered more slowly than expected from a slump triggered by an extra public holiday in June. The 0.2 percent expansion followed a 0.6 percent decline in June when gross domestic product was curtailed by an extra day off to mark Queen Elizabeth II's jubilee. Economists had expected growth of 0.3 percent. Authorities are stepping up efforts to deliver food, tents and other supplies to Pakistan. The country is grappling with food shortages after deadly floods devastated the impoverished country. Nearly 1400 people have died in the flooding. More than 30 million people have been displaced and 90% of the nation's crops have been destroyed. Deere is investing billions of dollars to expand into software to make its farming machinery more productive. The Wall Street Journal reports the company will introduce self-driving tractors and sprayers that distinguish weeds from crops this year. Deere projects that 10% of its annual revenue will come from fees for using software. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Fed actually wants the dollar to be relatively firm because a stronger dollar restrains economic activity and it reduces inflation because it reduces the cost of uh, import, imports into the United States. So the Fed is not unhappy with the dollar strength. This is just part and parcel, one aspect of how you tighten financial conditions. Well, the dollar's weaker today, not stronger. That was Bill Dudley, the Bloomberg Opinion and former New York Fed president from London. Good afternoon with Tom Keane. And Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Here's the price action for you. In the equity market, the bounce continues up 21, call it 22 points higher on the S&P 500, up a half of 1%. It yields lower by three basis points, the 327.74. The dollar a whole lot weaker against the euro and against sterling. Euro stronger by one full percentage point, euro dollar 101. 38. The King Charles III just touching down at Edinburgh Airport, now making his way <laughs> for an inspection of the Guard of Honour at the Palace of Holyrood House in Scotland, Tom. He should arrive there in the next 30 minutes or so. And then an hour later, something deeply, deeply emotional for us all to witness, Tom. An hour later, the King will walk behind the Queen's coffin from Holyrood House to St. Giles's Cathedral. With his two brothers and sisters scheduled, and of course we saw the uh, Princess Royale over the weekend uh, with uh, the Queen's coffin uh, into Edinburgh, but I, I would suggest, John, that all the symbolism here of the moment begins with, I believe, a meeting with Miss Sturgeon uh, near the Scottish Parliament, which is just across from the palace, and we hope to bring that to you. Uh, as we see it. A little bit later this afternoon. As I say then, to kick off the trading week, equities firmer, Tom yields pretty stable and a dollar a whole lot weaker. Vesely Sherebnikov joins us right now with UBS in FX and macro strategy as we try to frame a picture of where we are and because of the moment. Vesely, I think I need to start with the symbolism and the signals that we see in pound sterling. If we move beyond this period of mourning, if we move beyond a new King Charles III touring his domain, what will be the challenges to sterling? What are the domestic political challenges that can move pound sterling? Yeah, I think the domestic uh, political challenges are, are, are pretty clear, and I think they've been largely outlined by the Bank of England in, in some of their recent communications. I mean, it really is the risk of a... Uh, a deeper downturn. Um, I think from the currency perspective, that could mean that, you know, um, you know, inflation remains relatively high, but growth falters. 
Um, that's a fairly negative combination for a currency, obviously. But to some extent, you know, as important as domestic issues clearly are for the UK, um, I think it's in the same boat as the euro in the sense that energy prices and the energy crisis have really been, you know, in our mind and in our models, kind of the dominant driver here. So the reason I think you're seeing uh, some reprieve for sterling uh, and also the euro today also has a lot to do with um, natural gas prices coming off some of the pretty extreme levels that we've seen in the, over several weeks. There's certainly no nowhere near normal, um, but it's been a little bit of a correction there. And I think I think that's helping sterling. And frankly, I think that's where we're going to continue to focus uh, going forward. Where is the opportunity right now? I mean, we have the confusion of a Fed meeting. We've got a Bank of England meeting right beyond it. But on a global basis for UBS, where is the foreign exchange opportunity end of September? Look, I think that uh, in terms of some of the more recessionary trades, if you want, right, because I think it's still very clear that the global economy um, is in a, in, in a very weak phase. Uh, we think the dollar yen starting to look fairly misaligned, and I know there's been sort of a lot of talk around the, over the past week. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to justify current levels of dollar yen, even with U.S. rates. Um, so that means we're in this kind of overshoot zone that to some extent is testing the resolve of uh, Japanese policymakers. Um, that being said, you know, I think it, it, it really depends on U.S. inflation as well, right? So we expect uh, a fairly soft, by recent standards at least, uh, CPI print tomorrow, and I think that that could be kind of the initial impulse for some, some further correction in, in, in dollar yen. But I think, as you pointed out earlier, um, it's interesting that the dollar is, U.S. dollar is weaker, um, but not against the yen today. And, and that seems to be kind of at odds a little bit, I think, with the current economic backdrop. So I think that's maybe one where we, th we think things are fairly misaligned in the near term. Vizeli, are you saying that you are long the yen, that you think that it is going to strengthen versus the dollar here, regardless of whether the Bank of Japan abandons its peg, abandon its yields, uh, abandons its yield curve control? There, there could be sort of several paths to the same same outcome, right? I mean, I think that, that there's, if you think about the, the, the broad range of scenarios, it, it's, it's, it's possible that uh, global inflation continues to push higher and, and BOJ does nothing. I, I, I think that's a possibility and that's kind of the world we've been in. Uh, but the, the two other scenarios, I think, lead you to a stronger yen. That is, either global inflation continues to push higher and finally BOJ caves in, uh, right? And we're starting to see a little bit of noise in that direction. Or um, we're going to see finally U.S. inflation moderating kind of more prominently and they're kind of the, some of the some of the impulse for dollar yen high is being removed naturally, right, from the from the U.S. side of the equation. So it seems to us that you know it it's, affects markets overshoot. That's what they that's what they tend to do. <laughs> but the argument for uh, for dollar yen much higher, buying dollar yen at one one forty three or one forty four, um, seems to be relying purely, we would say, on momentum at this point rather than any kind of plausible evolution you know, either in U.S. rates or, or, or sort of Japanese policy. Vasily, I've got 60 seconds and I want to squeeze this in and just return to the euro story. The sequence, the logic behind the move today is essentially progress from Ukraine in Ukraine against <coughs> Russia it means gas prices lower, euro stronger. Do you question the logic behind that, that sequence from one to the other? Uh, I... I... I'm not sure this was just the, the, the situation in Ukraine, right? I, I mean, I think to some extent, if you look at gas storage levels and things like that, they have been uh, above sort of, be, you know, ahead of schedule for some time, right? So I think markets just simply took, took note of that. No, I think the euro actually has been very efficient in capturing some of those developments. So, so it, it, it more or less trades where it should be based on those natural gas prices where they are today. I would agree with you in a sense that we're not out of the woods, right? This is this crisis yeah. is by no means over, which means it's probably not the time to buy the euro quite yet. 101.45. Vasily, thank you. Vasily Serebrikov there of UBS. Talked a lot about the weakness in the dollar, also the rally in risk assets. Silly expecting Chairman Powell to lean against that. Here's some feedback for you, Bramo. That's the problem. Lean. Jerome needs to show up at the next FOMC with a hawk on his shoulder, a full body hawk tattoo and a mohawk, and instead of taking questions, screech like a hawk for an hour and a half. <laughs>
Twitter that's express brilliant. that. Twitter I express love that. that. Honestly, that's 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 kind of genius. I think maybe he'll take that up under consideration. I'm not sure Chairman Powell's going to arrive in quite that fashion, but it's amazing <laughs> that only a few weeks after we had that address in Jackson Hole, that already people are questioning their resolve. My favorite part about it is he could not have been clearer. And then other speakers, including Leo Brainerd, came out, could not have been clear. We are hawkish, we are hawkish, we are hawkish, we are hawkish. People are saying, but are you hawkish? We'll all look at the data tomorrow. <coughs> CPI, the main event for markets, just around a corner. You're on board with that now, aren't you? No, not CPI. really. Well, you're, 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 doing it. you're branding it, CPI Tuesday. It's, it's, there we go. From London, David Riley's coming up from Blue Bay Asset Management. This Good. is Bloomberg Surveillance. The ECB's Monday, the ECB's merit is quite clear, and that is about inflation. Fiscal stimulus from the UK, more fiscal stimulus coming across Europe is going to make their job harder, right? They need to continue to be diligent on rates staying high in order to stave off inflation. Fiscal response are going to play into inflation going forward. The Fed is not unhappy with the dollar strength. This is just part and parcel, one aspect of how you tighten financial conditions. It's a new economy, it's a new normal, and it needs a different type of analysis in order to adjust. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen. Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Witnessing history, a seamless transition of power from Queen to King, from mother to son, from London. Good afternoon to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK moments ago, King Charles III touching down in Edinburgh, Scotland and on his way to Hollywood House. One of the things to do, John, here is to look back in history is this is at the bottom of the Royal Mile in the Scottish Parliament and, of course, the acclaimed palace uh, going well back to Charles I's coronation there at the, at the demolished abbey right now that's just adjacent to the palace is the symbolism in the place of Scottish independence. And if you go back, John, to August of this year, there was a different dialogue between Sturgeon of Scotland and the London politics. And he will have an audience with the Scotland's First Minister, Nicola yeah. Sturgeon, a little bit later on. At least from there, the arrival, I understand, at Holyrood House taking place in the next 20 minutes or so. There'll be an inspection of the Guard of Honour. And then there's that very emotional walk that's set to take place behind the Queen's coffin on its way to St. Giles' Cathedral. Yeah, it's going to be incredibly somber and needs to strike the right tone at a time <clears throat> when there still is trying to be this unity. And I think that that's the important thing, a unity of the United Kingdom at a time when there is so much change in so many different places. The thing for us today, and I believe over the next week, we are a witness to history, a momentous <clears throat> occasion for the history of this nation, and I would argue for the rest of the world looking gone as well. But, Tom, as you've mentioned several times today, the problems that these global leaders have to deal with, they may well pause and reflect this Monday as they descend on the capital a week from today. But after that, oh. they've got to grapple with the same problems. There has been one good piece of news, I think one really important development over the weekend, Ukraine's progress in its war against Russia. And the war experts saying that it was a huge, it's the most significant weekend since April, if not back to the February 24th invasion uh, by Russia. We've had some good follow-up on that good conversation this morning uh, here. But, John, I would suggest it dovetails into, as Lisa mentioned earlier, natural gas prices ebb away, oil ebbs away. Dollar weaker. Possibly good news into October. Euro stronger, sterling stronger. Some big moves in FX yeah. today, Lisa. Yeah, really driven from this feeling of relief. And perhaps it has to do with Ukrainian developments over the weekend, but perhaps it also has to do with the fact that natural gas has been declining pretty steadily yeah. over the past few weeks. At what point, though, is this just noise as we head into the winter and we keep having to double down on this idea that what will determine a softer landing or a very hard one will be the weather and whether we get a cold winter? Oh, for the ECB, never mind the staff forecasts. And we're all still talking about those staff forecasts of a week ago. No recession. No recession in the baseline for the ECB, when I think the baseline for many people is not whether we get a recession, <clears> it's how deep it would ultimately be. But the severity of what's about to take place on the continent, Tom, will come down is, to how cold this winter will be. Yeah, the weather, yes, I agree with that. But I think just as important off of September 21 as September 22. And let me ask you a question, John. Frankly, I haven't asked in the blur of the moment. Is the United Kingdom in recession? At the moment? Most people would say no in the future, possibly. That's I would say guess. one thing that's yeah. changed the calculation in the last week is just massive, massive fiscal intervention 
from this Prime Minister. Which that keeps has changed you the away outlook. from recession. You would hope so. Yeah. But, Lisa, regardless of the new cap from this Prime Minister and the willingness to take on unlimited liability to cover the cost of these bills, bills now are much, much higher than they were a year ago. And, and people have still got to grapple with that reality. And you're seeing that borne out in the data earlier this morning in the United Kingdom. We did get GDP figures and they right. showed the UK stagnating. And so at what point is a tipping point not that difficult to see given the pressure that people feel with a potential double digit uh, inflation right. rate for a longer period of time? To interrupt here quickly, uh, a distant shot, John, as the king enters Edinburgh of the castle and then he will descend down to Holyrood House. Uh, but just, you know, the, again, the history here is just stunning. We don't need to do a history lesson of the moment, but this is an original moment, I would suggest, for the United Kingdom. It's something many of us have never seen before, Tom, and something yeah. some of us will possibly never see again. Uh, you think of, of the economics that we cover every single day. The uh, sterling at the coronation of the Queen was, I believe, $2.80, and we come down with of the challenges. Of course, you checked that, of course. I checked that as well, and I was sort of surprised. I thought it was actually a higher statistic, but uh, I, to, to see the challenges that are to be faced, which we will cover with our great team, and I really commend you folks, Bloomberg UK is an extraordinary effort here to be up to date on these set of crises, and that's the issue. It's not one crisis. It's not, I'd say it's starkly different from the United States. It's a set of crises. Of all these challenges, of which there are many, there was one crisis, Tom, that was on the horizon that we all hoped to avoid, and that was in the FX market. And I reflected on this a little bit earlier this morning, and I think we should do it again. The very fact that we were having a little look at 113 and didn't break <coughs> 114, mm -hmm. and now this morning, this afternoon here in London, we're back to 117 levels. The meeting for the Bank of England governor, which was set to be this week right. and is now next week, was always going to be difficult, hard and complex. The very fact, though, Sterling has rallied back, I think, for the governor of this Bank of England, that is a positive development, relatively speaking, to what we were looking at just a week or so ago. Yeah, it's, it's a bounce, and I'm not going to play technical analysis here, but certainly it's cutting the right way for a new prime minister. We have to remember she's been out of the picture here for a few days. We have a new prime minister of the United Kingdom. We do. That's been underplayed, I think, here in London. At least it's been on top of that as well. The problems of this prime minister, Lisa, front and centre. I mean, for the British public, of course, we're all following this at the moment. But to Tom's point, we've still got an energy crisis. We've still got a lot of problems to work through, and they don't go away. And we got news earlier this morning that October 1st was when some of that aid was going to get starting uh, to get distributed for to consumers. UK households for consumers. So what does that mean? We don't know necessarily for businesses. But to get that through during a period now, we're out of respect for the Queen's memory. They are not doing deliberations. It's going to be quite a feat. We'll continue to follow King Charles III as he makes his way to Holyrood House, Scotland, the Palace of Holyrood House. From there... Tom, of course, he'll move us on to St. Giles Cathedral, a, a deeply emotional walk which is set to take place in the next hour or so, walking behind the Queen's coffin from the Palace of Holyrood House <coughs> to St. Giles' Cathedral, Tom. Just the next phase in a long sequence of events that's set to take place as we work our way towards this time next week where we have the funeral for the Queen. It, it, it's a path forward, but for the family. This is different. Balmoral is owned by the royal family. It is different than the other castles. And I would suggest there Scotland is different. And, and, and again, what we'll see here, and I will save the history here for when we actually observe these events, but they are stealing themselves for significant symbolism, which goes back beyond Charles I in roughly 1620. Tom, I opened the show and I said that what we're witnessing here is a seamless transition of power from queen to king. From mother to son. From mother to son. We forget that. And, and, yeah, and Williams, same thing in the last 12 hours. We'll continue to follow these pictures as they come in from Scotland for you. We also need to follow the developments in this market with equity futures bouncing back. Sterling a whole lot stronger, the dollar a whole lot weaker. I reflected on this a little bit earlier this morning. The very fact that we've got all this dollar weakness and still the yen is struggling to find some strength. I think we can turn to David Riley, the chief investment strategist at Blue Bay asset management. David, can we start with foreign exchange and work our way to your world? What do you make of the dollar weakness this morning? Yeah, I think some of the weakness that we're seeing in the dollar is reflecting, you know, both the repricing of the rate outlook for uh, the, the, the euro after last <coughs> week's ECB meeting. And I think also some sort of 
you know, a little bit of sort of slither of optimism in terms of uh, recession risk, um, including for, for, for Europe, because I think you know, we've been discussing the UK, but one aspect about the UK is this huge fiscal package. Uh, we know this discussion is going on in Brussels about uh, an energy price uh, measures as, as, as well. And so I think kind of a little bit sort of thinking, well, you know, somewhat higher rates may be the worst case scenario in terms of a severe downturn in, in, in Europe is um, mm -hmm. less likely. And, and other things being equal, I think that's kind of broadly supportive for, you know, the euro to some extent for, 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 for sterling. As you right. say, you know, yen is the standout in, in that respect. David, I've been dying to talk to you with your holistic knowledge of the gilt market. We see a new king shaking hands in Scotland and all the news to come on the fiscal solution that Lisa Abramowitz talks about. Can the United Kingdom withstand this fiscal impulse? Um, I mean, the United Kingdom can certainly, I think, finance that without having a sort of, you know, outright... Um, if you like, sort of funding crisis. But I do think that it does imply that longer end gilt yields will be um, higher. I do think it actually something which won't be welcomed by the new <clears throat> prime minister. I do think if you're the old lady of Threadneedle Street, then you are um, also looking at this package and saying other things being equal, it implies higher um, uh, Bank of England um, uh, base rates. So, you know, the UK and the UK government will be able to finance this package, but I think it's going to have to pay a price for it. And I think ultimately there's going to be higher yields. And I think, you know, I'd still be relatively bearish on sterling. David, what do you need to see from the plan that evidently is going to leave uh, consumers with some aid from the UK government as soon as October 1st? What do you need to see to assess the path forward for how high yield yields could really go? Well, I think the first thing is um, we actually still don't have an official costing for um, the plan that was um, announced, obviously, on the day that we got the very sad news about the passing of um, Queen uh, Elizabeth. We actually don't have the numbers. I mean, there's estimates floating around ranging from, you know, 100 billion uh, British pounds up to, you know, 150 um, billion plus, but we still don't know really um, the details of the plan and ultimately um, in terms of the um, costing. So I think that's going to be important in terms of working out, you know, what the path for for for, for guilds will be. And also then, obviously, you know, the Bank of England and the Bank of England reaction function. I think one of the themes that's starting to come through, not just, you know, from the UK, but also transferring to Europe, is that we are starting to now see the emergence of a, of a kind of fiscal put, if you like, in terms of uh, growth. But I think that's clearly, I think, broadly positive, but it does mean, I think, that it implies that we're kind of deferring high inflation or keeping high inflation for, for longer, and I think that then fits into the theme that actually rates um, stay higher for longer as well. David Riley, thank you, of Blue Bay Asset Management. David, thank you very much. Tom, continuing to follow King Charles III as he makes his way to Holyrood House. In practice here, for what is presumed to be after the funeral on Monday, which is a tour of his Great Britain. It'll be fascinating to see how... It, we've talked about this uh, on Friday, the shift from prince to king, but also the shift in moving to the grind, the royal grind of duties, and part of that is to visit Wales, visit Scotland, maybe visit Northern Ireland. I'm not, uh, I'm not sure on that. The four nations of this United Kingdom, and Lisa ultimately works United Country, but for many, are grieving the loss of their queen. There will be a deeply emotional scene taking place in an hour, expected to take place in an hour, Lisa, when we see the king walk behind the queen's coffin from it's... Holyrood House to St. Giles' Cathedral. She wasn't just the queen of the United Kingdom. She was the queen for a commonwealth that may not ever have a monarchy again, if you look at some of the uh, discussion. Futures Positive this afternoon from London. This is Bloomberg. I think it's very difficult to be the head of a, of a central bank right now because you're fighting an inflation that is that is partly from energy and partly from psychology, and you're fighting growth that's falling because of it. So to be raising rates aggressively into falling growth and energy you can't control means credit spreads uh, should have a premium, and as you said, more debt uh, on, the, on, the, on the heels of it. They don't have the premium that Brian Weinstein and Morgan Stanley would like to see, <clears throat> that's for sure.
from London this afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Here's the state of things right now in markets, particularly looking at stateside, where equity futures are positive by around about four tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. One hour and 12 minutes away from the opening bow, with equities up, yields lower by four basis points to 326.59. A dollar that's weaker, euro stronger, 101.48 on euro dollar positive, one full percentage point. All ahead, Tom, at this time tomorrow, we'll be counting down to CPI. I was going to say, CPI. 24 hours and 11 minutes away All about from inflation. what matters. All Just about so, inflation. Which is more important to you, John, headline or core, quickly? A core, month on month. Yeah. I think the core month on month core, yeah. what happens here is going to dictate. Even some people modeling a decline. They want to see a convincing, sustained mm -hmm. decline in inflation over time, which gives them right. confidence that we're heading back towards 2% inflation. And you heard from Governor Waller last week, who's, who's not convinced of that right now. We welcome all of you on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television, an extraordinary Monday of history in Scotland, of war in Ukraine, and of course what we're seeing in the markets. Right now we turn to Ukraine. has been a absolutely unique weekend of infantry movement, which means only we can speak with General Hodges. Ben Hodges is a former commanding general for U.S. Army Europe. He is a Pershing chair in strategic studies at SEPA. But so importantly, Ben Hodges, I'm going to go back to you doing what you do best. You were an instructor at the United States Army Infantry School. When you instruct infantry, and particularly if they're Ukraines going after rapidly retreating Russians, what should they do? Uh, three things. Number one, do not let up the pressure. Do not give the Russians a chance to stop and, and turn around and, and fight. So that, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, keep using your combined arms. In other words, infantry, tanks, artillery, engineers, all of these things working together. That's what Ukraine is doing so well and that the Russians have not done well. And then finally, uh, unleash uh, Ukrainian air power. Um, even though the Russians had all the advantages, they've never been able to dominate the airspace over Ukraine. And I think the Ukrainians are going to try right. to take advantage of that. <clears throat> this conversation reminds me of one U.S. grant, an unknown, going down the Mississippi River and teaching uh, the North how to prosecute a full-force invasion. What do we need from the Ukrainians, Ukrainians now to be like Grant in our civil war? Is it simply they need more material? Well, for sure, uh, they have the same sort of strategic eye as General Grant did. This is about you have to crush your enemy. And, and that's that's from President Zelensky on down. He said this thing started with Crimea and it's going to end with Crimea. And so uh, what they do need from us, of course, two things. One, they need continued delivery of the type of weapons and ammunition that are helping them make the difference to destroy Russian logistics, destroy Russian command and control. But also the uh, the sanctions. The, the sanctions really are having an effect on Russia's ability both uh, in terms of their own defense industry, uh, but also domestically. I think more and more Russian people are beginning to feel this war that Putin was trying to shield from them. Well, Lieutenant General, that's where I wanted to go, because there is some discussion about the possibility of conscription. If Vladimir Putin does not want to come to the table, does not want to come to some sort of resolution, if he is running out of troops, as the reports have uh, suggested, what is Vladimir's, uh, Vladimir Putin's response to this? How concerned are you about some retaliatory measure that we're perhaps not expecting? Well, uh, you're right that they have a very serious manpower problem uh, in the Russian military, which is not doesn't sound like what I would have said uh, a year ago. Uh, most of their recruits now, many of them are conscripts, come from uh, way outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. The, the Kremlin has tried to avoid uh, drafting anybody from the two major metropolitan areas because, again, they want to shield the public from what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, that Nobody wants to fight. Uh, nobody wants to get involved in this war. They know what's going to happen if they do get sent into Ukraine. So uh, I think part of the reason President Putin has avoided uh, doing this general mobilization is because he wants to preserve the fairy tale, but also they'll be humiliated. People will not show up. They don't have the equipment to, to equip. They don't have the uniforms and weapons to equip another 100,000 troops. And it would still be months before they would yeah. be effective in any way.
So, Lieutenant General, how does this end? And does it reassert Russia as a member of the global economy, or does it leave it incredibly isolated? I think it's going to be a long time before we can look at Russia and, and work with them as if things are quasi-normal. Uh, this, this will end, I believe, uh, early next year. Uh, the, the Ukrainians are going to push the Russians back to the 23 February line before the end of this year, I believe. Of course, I could be proven wrong here in another month or two, but that's how I think that's going to happen. And then Crimea, uh, probably early sometime next year, a combination of fighting and, and perhaps some negotiated uh, conclusion. But the Ukrainians are not going to stop, nor should they stop. What does Russia look like when this is over? Of course, I cannot for sure what kind of friction and things are happening inside the Kremlin. Uh, we are all seeing various reports of, of things that are happening there, a lot of uh, finger pointing, and people may start falling out of windows again. I mean, it, it's going to be a pretty rough scene around Moscow, I think, for the next uh, few months. General, thank you. We appreciate your time today, <clears throat> sir. Ben Hodge is there, the former commanding general for the U.S. Army. Lisa, even if it does conclude next year, and I know the general would agree with this sentiment that forecasting geopolitics is about as difficult as forecasting anything right now. I think, I think the only thing that makes you look more foolish is trying to call the oil price anytime soon, or gas prices for that matter. Gas is down today. The euro's stronger. There's plenty of reasons for that. But when you think about the durability of a move like this one, even if you've got a conclusion to this war, I keep going back to these sanctions and the policy response to it. That's not going to get unwound immediate law, immediately or at all. Which is the reason why I asked Ben Hodges, former lieutenant governor, uh, uh, commander, uh, whether we would see some sort of return of Russia back onto the international stage. Because if you don't, does anything change with the energy backdrop, even if the war technically ends? The gas prices are changing today. They're down almost 9%. The euro changing too. <clears throat> it's a whole lot stronger. Futures just about positive. We're fading, though, as we get closer towards the opening bell. Equity futures are positive a third of 1% after being a fair bit higher than that a little bit earlier in the session. The euro dollar, positive one full percentage point, 101.48. Joining us shortly, Stephanie Aronson of Brookings from London. This is Bloomberg. This afternoon from London, good afternoon to you all as we count you down to the opening bell in New York City. Good morning to those of you waiting for that. About an hour away with equity futures positive on the S&P 500. Yields are stable to lower through much of this morning in the bond market on the 10-year. Yields have been climbing for six consecutive weeks. They're lower today by three or four basis points to 327.36. The euro is stronger, the dollar is weaker, 101.40. Some of the reason for that, Lisa, and you and I have been going over that through much of this morning and into the afternoon here in London. It's just the connection from the stories, the news we hear over the weekend about progress being made by Ukrainian forces against Russian forces, the pullback that we've seen in gas. And one thing you and I are both on the same page on, that it's not the war per se alone, exclusively, that has caused this move in gas and energy. It's the response to the war. It's the policy. So it's the potential for a change in policy that we need to focus on more than anything. And Dan Tannenbaum, a good friend of this program over the years and sanctions expert, said this, Lisa, just moments ago, pinged me a message. These sanctions won't go away for years. And it's going to take years to come up with the alternative. The European Union is still discussing what their energy plan is going to be, an emergency energy plan. Uh, earlier this morning, we were hearing from EU officials that they are going to have a mandatory power demand cut. So they're going to be uh, trying to target this from both sides. But this is not going to be clear cut. And it's not clear to see an easy read through to a currency response at this time, regardless of the developments on the ground. Tom, gas prices down about 9% this afternoon. I, I did a technical study of the Netherlands, and I'm going to say they're down, but they don't signify any sense of a downward trend. Have we broken some form of technical level? I don't see it, but I, just, I defer to Javier Bloss and, you know, Stuart Wallace and all of our hydrocarbons. So we were down about 7% this morning. We're down, now down about 9 yeah. Last week, down 35 The week before that, down about 36%. Yeah, so I'm, we've had a steady drop-off over the yeah. last two and a bit weeks. But, boy, what a moonshot it was before. Oh, I mean, the chart's and still vertical, see... and we can pull up the and chart again, and look at it. But I would suggest that the pricing that we've seen is this faith in the Ukrainian advance against Russia. 
It's that simple. Yes, but to Dan Tanapau's <clears> point, <throat> it's the sanctions and the policy response to the war that matter here. And even if we have a conclusion to this war, and I think we all hope we have a conclusion right. to this war, in the minds of many, Tom, the sanctions aren't going to go away for a long, long time. So can we actually resolve some of these issues I, I, in the energy market? I, I, General Hodges is just telling us the sanctions work. Others disagree. You know, sure. We'll have to see. It's that simple. Uh, futures up 13, Dow futures up 42. Uh, this morning, we welcome all of you. Stephanie Aronson with us, economist at the Brookings Institution. As we look at the state of the American economy, as we look towards this inflation report, but also just the general mix of the American economy. Stephanie, how complex is the American economy now versus what we see in Europe? It seems to be more successful, quieter, maybe with a better plan forward than what we see in the tumult of Europe. I think it's true that the situation in Europe is much more complicated, although there are certainly spillovers from the war in Ukraine to the U.S. economy. We, our energy markets are just less affected than they are. And also, there are a lot of direct spillovers of the war, too, in Europe in the form of the refugee crisis. So I think there is just much more tumult now in Europe. And while it's certainly spilling over to the U.S. economy, uh, it's just a less complicated situation. <clears throat> I will suggest, Stephanie, that Brookings owns a high ground on the research of the effect of inflation and the effect of slowdown across deciles and quintiles of America. It's unevenly distributed. Everyone tells us that. But how bad is it unevenly distributed? How much is the middle class of America getting crushed right now? I mean, lower income and middle income Americans spend a lot more of their budget on things like food and gas. And one thing that's really been striking in the past year is how much these prices have risen. So the effects are much larger for them. Stephanie, can you tell us about Jackson Hole and your takeaway from Jackson Hole? And how surprised you were by how hawkish some of these central bank participants actually are? Because it's only a few weeks later that market participants are coming on this program and questioning the credibility of those institutions and their resolve to do what they have told us they're going to do. Yes, I think that the Fed and other central banks were clearly trying to send a signal to their publics that they were on the case of inflation and that this was their main priority now, even potentially at the expense of there being significant slowdowns or recessions in the economy. And I think Part of it was a response to the movements we had seen in the markets leading up to Jackson Hole, where there seemed to be some sense <clears throat> that perhaps the Fed and other central banks wouldn't act uh, as aggressively. And I think clearly now, um, you know, they have sent the signal that they are going after inflation first and foremost. Which raises an interesting question, Stephanie, at a time when we're expecting a CPI print that will potentially be softer, maybe even negative, at least in the headline number, albeit the core is expected to continue, <clears throat> continue to rise, but you're seeing gasoline prices come off. You're seeing even uh, certain retail companies put their clothing on stales. You're seeing a lot of movement toward lower prices ahead. How does the Fed respond? Do they remain hawkish in the face of progress, even though uh, a lot of people are seeing it continue to accelerate in certain sectors? Yeah, I think so clearly the step down in oil and gas prices is very welcome, and that is probably going to depress the headline number, or as you said, it could even decline. But I think there is a lot of momentum still in the core. <clears throat> uh, we're expecting, you know, for instance, housing prices to be very persistently high and other sectors as well. And so I think that this one reading is not going to be enough to dissuade the Fed from a large movement at its next meeting, even if it is a bit softer than the numbers had been coming in recently. What are you watching, Stephanie, to really gauge how quickly inflation is coming down? We know that used car prices have declined. We know that gasoline prices have declined, although that's questionable whether it will stick once the Strategic Petroleum Reserve is no longer being deployed. At what point are you looking at other stickier measures like rent and some of the other areas to really get, be your guide? I mean, I think clearly looking at some of the other sectors, what's happening in rents, as I mentioned, 
Also, what's happening in good prices is going to be key for monitoring inflation going forward. <clears throat> and I'm also looking at the labor market because the Fed is going to need to see a real slowdown in the labor market. We've made a little progress on that front, but the three-month moving average of payroll employment right. growth is still above 300,000. That's a big number. And so I think we really are going to need to see that slowing down further before the Fed can feel comfortable that they're going to be able to achieve their target. And Stephanie, your wheelhouse here is a study of labor participation. We see cultural, institutional. We see it uh, by male, female over 30, 40, 50 uh, years. The dynamic of labor participation now, what does that signal about two Americas out there, an employable America and a less employable America? I mean, I think you've hit on a very important factor going forward that, you know, obviously some of the decline in labor force participation we've seen in, you know, over the past decade really is just sort of the natural result of the aging population. But there actually has also been a decline in the labor force participation of sort of prime age men, men 25 to 54, who we would really expect to be working right now. And a lot of that decline has taken place among lower skilled men. And I think it does uh, speak to the very difficult labor market that these men face. And that's going to be a long term structural problem that the U.S. is going to have to deal with. Stephanie, great to catch up. And again, fantastic to see you over in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Great Thanks for being you. with us. Thanks. Stephanie Aronson there of the Brookings Institution. Lisa, we went back and forth on this after we caught up with those Fed officials in Jackson Hole. They're forecasting higher unemployment. They're forecasting some pain in this labor market. And they can talk up higher rates and lower inflation all they like. Once you start to see materially higher unemployment, a deceleration of growth accompanied with that, there's going to be a lot of questions about this policy, a lot more than the questions they've already had. There's a political question, too. Because right now, a lot of politicians are saying inflation is the primost, uh, foremost concern, and so they're fine with the Federal Reserve that's hawkish. But what happens when you do start to see that deceleration, to your point, how much resolve can they have, especially considering <clears throat> that this is unchartered territory? The language of the White House, Tom, so far is that, has been that we will give space to the Federal Reserve to do what they need to do to bring down inflation. Now, when unemployment starts to shift in the other direction, well, exactly. I wonder if that's going to be in the statement I, for the weeks I, and months I, to come. I think the message has changed from four, five, six months ago and that the space is occurring right now. Shock because of the data, which shows how important tomorrow's data is into September 21. I guess the good news for this Federal Reserve, <clears> and I stress the good news for the Federal Reserve and not good news per se, is that unemployment was climbing, at least in the last jobs report, off the back of higher participation, which led to softer wages. I'm not sure anyone's jumping on that particular data point with conviction and saying that's going to be the trend for the next several months. But maybe that's the opening for this Federal Reserve to start talking up a so-called, can I say it, soft... <laughs> Soft landing? You could say it, whatever that landing. means. I mean, honestly, uh, yeah, what does that mean? There's a transitory just, comment, I, but, but you could say I'm it. Not, I'm not sure. A it's a new, no, does you that say, mean no recession? Does that just mean that the unemployment rate doesn't rise? The theory is, in a perfect scenario, there are all these people on the sidelines from the labor market that are going to come back. That participation rate will go up, and suddenly wages will get a little bit softer in terms of how high they climb, and everyone will be happy because the unemployment rate, people won't be laid off yeah, in the same kind of I way. I thought about this this morning. This is important. X number of months ago, what percentage of the punditry was calling for a recession? It was a lot. Tom. Has it occurred? At the end of the year, and I often go back to the summary of economic projections <clears throat> in December of 2021, and we'll get another set of forecasts of this Fed meeting in a couple of weeks' time. They were looking for 0.9% on Fed funds by year end this year. Yeah. That was the forecast at the end of December for the year ahead. And we're talking about a 75 basis point hike in a single meeting again. Lisa, now that's a change. I love the that's way that you do this. Change. You're basically just showing that their forecasts can be treated with that in mind. Really? <laughs> I'm just I'm putting it out there and letting people putting, know. Okay, well, that's the conclusion. So Fine. you need to watch and listen to Bloomberg Surveillance. Features up 410s from London. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo king charles iii is vowing to uphold parliamentary democracy and follow what he called the selfless duty of his mother queen elizabeth ii 
Addressing Parliament today, the king said he felt, quote, the weight of history surround him. Charles is now in Scotland. Will he lead a procession carrying the queen's coffin through Edinburgh? The queen will be laid to rest one week from today. The euro surged the most in six months after a European central bank policymaker said further interest rate hikes may be needed. Traders are betting U.S. inflation data later this week could undermine the need for aggressive tightening in the U.S. The ECB raised its key rate by an unprecedented 75 basis points last week to curb the fastest pace of consumer price growth on record. ARK Investment Management's Kathy Wood is warning about the risks of U.S. auto debt if there's a drop in prices. In a Twitter post, she said the prevalence of ride-hailing services means that people won't prioritize paying car loans as they did during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. The used car market is showing signs of softening after prices skyrocketed during the pandemic. Twitter is saying no to Elon Musk's latest effort to cancel his agreement to buy the social network. Twitter says Musk's latest move is, quote, invalid and wrongful. That's according to a filing today. The billionaire says the company's treatment of a whistleblower gave him another reason to walk away from his $44 billion deal. It's his third attempt to withdraw his offer. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. What we've had so far is a willingness by governments across Europe to accommodate uh, the shock from rising energy prices. Um, with rising interest rates, it's going to be increasingly problematic for these governments to maintain this kind of, of, of fiscal policy. Jill Malwerker there, the chief economist at AXA Investment Managers. We are about 43 minutes away, 42 minutes away from the opening bound in New York City. Equity futures are positive on the S&P 500. <clears throat> Just about 4,100 on my screen right now, looking at S&P 500 futures, up 16 points, up four-tenths of one percent. Yield to lower by two or three <coughs> basis points, 3.2831. Tom, euro dollar, look at that, positive one percent, yeah. 101.41. Stronger mm. euro, weaker dollar. Modest leg up here, and you see it much more in stronger euro versus yen dynamics with stronger euro uh, today. We have a chart in New York on a Monday. Here is Kriti Gupta. Well, Tom, we have to talk about the power crisis. I wanted to put in some perspective for our TV and radio audience here, which brings me to my chart of the day. We're looking at German and French power prices going back about two years. So you see this kind of big move in, in 2021. It abates. And then a more parabolic move in 2022, which once again is coming back down from its peak that you saw in the late end of August, still at record highs, though. And I really want to put this into perspective. Uh, once again, electricity prices largely linked to gas prices because all the sources of energy well, they bid into the same grid, and of course, gas prices are the more expensive source, so they tend to drive the market. For the American tourists, I'll put it into some perspective, though. Here's what it means for you. The Eiffel Tower, their lights are going to turn off earlier. The London Tube, for example, they're experiencing severe delays because of these power supply issues. Tom, this is going to be a key story about whether or not these power prices ever come down, uh, simply as they deal with uh, the issues that come with gas prices and, of course, renewable energy. Kriti Gupta, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it. There's some terrific journalism today at Bloomberg News on oil, on hydrocarbons, on all that it means for us. And, of course, leading that coverage is Will Kennedy, our managing editor for Energy and Commodities, who we're thrilled to join in London today. Thank you to all of our London team for what you've done the last number of weeks and months. Will, it's just been huge value uh, in New York for us. Today I got a double barrel. No surprise that Javier Blas is out guns blaring, but also David Fickling writes as well on the unintended consequences Mr. Putin may have unleashed. Let's cover that concept right now. As you sum away all of our coverage, what are the unintended consequences right now in oil? Well, clearly, Putin has made uh, energy part of his campaign in Ukraine and part of putting pressure on the West in not supporting Ukraine. It hasn't worked so far. But in the short term, in energy terms, it has been working. As Kriti explained there, it's causing huge economic pain for European countries as they pay unprecedented prices for their power and gas. The point that David's making is how long will that work for and what comes next? And what comes next is a continent that says, right, we have to find a way to live without your gas, Mr. Putin. We have to try something new. So the point he's making, and he's drawing a comparison with the Arab embargo in the early 70s, is ultimately the winners from this are not likely to be 
uh, Moscow, even if it works in the short term. Longer term, it's the other suppliers of both gas from elsewhere in the world mm -hmm. and new forms of energy who are going to win from this crisis. This is such a hard issue to get your arms around, Will, not only because of all the forecasting error that's inherent in this process, but just gauging what's going on on the ground, whether there is sufficient stockpiles in Germany to manage through a cold winter. We've heard a lot of varying reports on how well prepared Europe really is. What's your sense of that just heading in based on where we are right now? In terms of stockpiles, Germany is ahead of where it wanted to be. I think the current number is 88% full. Uh, it's only mid-September. That looks pretty good. But as we discussed last week, it's going to be the second half of the winter, which is problematic. Once those stockpiles are run down, it's going to be hard to secure the gas supply they need. We say it again and again, but I'd reiterate it. Weather will matter here. But it's interesting what's happened to the price. It's come down. It's still very elevated, but it's come down from the extreme levels we saw at August. And I think that's a sign that policymakers are starting to get serious in addressing this question and that's taken some of the extreme heat out of the market. Um, it's all going to depend on the weather. In the UK, I wonder how you'd respond to this, Will. It seems like they're almost incentivizing demand with the plan they unveiled last week. How's this going to work out? I think that's a really interesting point, John. You've got a big contrast between the European plan where we've been reporting more tales, details right now, which has a very specific target for demand reduction. There is no target, apart from a few warm words, for demand reduction in the UK. So you're saying this is a fixed price, and it is high. People will respond sure. at the margin. It's not cheap energy, but you're, there's no strategy to bring right. demand down in a serious way. It's an interesting contrast between Britain and Europe. Completely though. unfair question, but it's unfair Monday. What percentage of the United Kingdom public is oblivious to the high price of hydrocarbons? Is it a razor-thin, rich, rich, rich margin, or is it a good percentage of the people? I think it's something that everyone knows about, to be honest, Tom. It's been a matter of huge interest the last few months. In the past, it wasn't something that people thought about much. Energy was relatively cheap. We were probably paying, on average, about £1,000 a year. Even at the levels that Trust is proposing, you're talking about a two-and-a-half times increase. That's something that gets almost everyone's attention, to be honest. Will Kennedy, thank you. And I think we all noticed just a little bit earlier this morning, Lisa, a plan for the consumer. We've got a date for that. We're still ironing out the details for businesses. And that's going to be a huge concern when you hear the reports you're hearing out of Germany over the last few weeks that some parts of industries are just shutting down. They're just shutting down. Yeah. And what does this mean for uh, industries and companies that are trying to reshore a lot of the production at a time when their currency <clears throat> is losing power on the global stage? In other words, how do you deal with the inflationary inputs of having to import more if your industry gets shut down because they don't have enough energy to keep going at the same kind of tilt? And that's the better news today. Commodities soften. You're seeing the likes of sterling stronger. Yeah. 117 TK a little bit earlier on cable. That's a turnaround from where we were a week ago. Yeah, I, I think turnaround's the right phrase. I'm not willing to say, you know, technical bottoms of that. I'll leave that to other uh, people. But, John, what I would notice, besides the real yield hitting a 0 0.90, which is stunning, now a positive 0 0.86, 86 basis points, is also the Bloomberg Financial Index has not given way to more restriction. We, it's not gone to where Jerome Powell would like it to be. Market-based inflation expectations have just done this, Bramo. Yeah rolled over. Yeah, which really raises this issue, right? <clears throat> People feel like the Fed, the ECB, can get inflation under control, or at least they will get the cooperation of oil oh. and gas. But they might not have to inflict the same kind of pain that they're saying that they will probably inflict on the economy. I mean, this is just an interesting uh, dynamic with the market not fully buying. Well, I'm going to give credit to Claudia Sam. I may be wrong on this, but someone was writing about the anchor frayed, the rope of the anchor, the inflation anchor, Afraid. I'm not sure how afraid it is. I can't. I don't have a handle on that. The chairman Powell, when he interrupted ECB President Christine Lagarde's news conference last week, he went on and on about that repeatedly. He could do that the day following. The Maybe inflation. the governor of England will speak the day which, before. Would he like to compete with the governor of Bank of England <laughs> and get up early and do that too? <laughs> I still don't understand what that was last week. Well, how much is this really? I mean, in fairness, how much is it his fault and how much is it the Cato Institute for not necessarily being... Chairman Powell yeah. on line one. He'd like to move his, his panel to an hour later. What the, what's the Cato Institute going to say? Unfortunately, we can't accommodate him this year. Perhaps we'll do something in 12 months. They'll say that my son-in-law was the one who interrupted your <laughs> press conference about Bitcoin. We'll interrupt yeah, yours. Exactly. I'm not sure that's what happened.
at all. <laughs> Equity futures are positive on the S&P. The opening bell is about 35 minutes away. From London, this is Bloomberg. This is an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Equity market rallying going into the opening bell. Equity futures positive live from London for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive. <coughs> Got to say, TK, going into this opening bell, we wake up Monday with a better tone to this market. Better tone of the market, and it's coming off of certainly good news out of Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine doing much better, but far more, John. It's about a quiescent inflation guesstimate for it. I put guesstimate on it because as we go to tomorrow's inflation report, there's a real mystery to it. Elisa, a better tone in this equity market, better tone in Europe too. Wow. Gas prices down, sterling stronger, euro much stronger. And a sense that there is some sort of plan formulating in Europe with respect to how to diminish some of the demand, how to bring gas and oil prices down ahead of a winter that really relies as much on the weather as it does anything else. Our team coverage here at Bloomberg starts right now with Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington, D.C., and Maria Tadeo over in Brussels. Maria, I want to come first to you. The progress that we're told that Ukraine is making over the weekend. Your thoughts? Well, it is significant. It does show that this is an army that can be competitive if they have uh, the weapons. Those who said that Ukraine could not keep up a fight or could not put up a fight have been proven wrong. I think the real question now is, can it be sustained? And yesterday, uh, the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, put out a post on Telegram, which to me was so telling. He said, at this stage, we'd rather not have electricity, we'd rather not have food, not have heat, in, but get rid of the Russians that are in our land. And he continued to say there will be a liberation of all of our territories. So really, a lot of this does show the spirit uh, that this nation has. And I have to tell you, Jonathan, a lot of the Ukrainian officials, too, that I speak with on the record, but also behind the scenes, they also tell me, you have to understand, this is the fight for our lives. This is an existential question uh, for us. So for them, there is no question that the fight will continue as long as they get the weapons they need. I think now for the Europeans, and this is a real question, is whether or not they'll supply those weapons, because as you know very well, there have been concerns, particularly about putting weapons and yeah. pumping this country with weapons could lead to escalation. And Marie, this brings a question about what the U.S. is doing about it. And we've been talking about this for a number of weeks now. How much are you looking to the U.S. when it comes to price caps for Russia, as was proposed on Friday at a time when the EU is also taking the lead on how to direct some of the energy policy? Yeah, I think when you look at what's going on between the United States and Europe and as well as what is still coming out of Russia in ter terms of energy exports, you really need to differentiate between natural gas, which is one story, which Europe it was tremendously relying on in terms of pipeline natural gas from Russia, which over the summer we did have the U.S. surpass that pipeline natural gas in terms of liquefied natural gas going to Europe. And then the other, when it comes to a price cap globally, is really the oil situation. And this is the one that the U.S. is keenly focused on because, of course, the oil price around the world will infiltrate down to what everyday consumers are playing, paying at the gasoline pump. So that is why they want to get, and they have the G7 on board, they're going to implement this plan, but it's also making sure others fall into line, even if they are not signing on the dotted line that they are going to sign up for a price cap. What you are hearing from the administration, we heard from the Deputy uh, Treasury Secretary over the weekend talking about the fact that this is still one part of the Russian economy that has been able to actually grow, and that is the oil industry. So they want to make sure Russian oil stays on the market, but it's capped at a price. And in order to get access to this European insurance and shipping, you're going to have to get in line. That's the message. And marie how does the news over the weekend of a much better Ukraine military effort. Anne-Marie, how does that change the debate, the urgency at the Pentagon and on the Hill? 
I think the debate maintains that they need to continue supplying and helping Ukraine because what does that say, the fact that Ukraine is able to push back? You have this statement over the weekend when I saw the Russian Defense Ministry pop up with this statement on my Telegram channel saying that they are, quote, regrouping. Maria was correct before saying that this is a rare admission from Russia, from the Kremlin, from the military, saying that they do need to regroup. But the concern now is what does this mean? What we see Putin has when he starts to lose some strength is that he digs in. And the worry, of course, and the concern is that he will come back harder. So that would almost uh, extend the debate in the United States to actually potentially more support is going to be needed. And that's what the White House is asking for in terms of Congress, in terms of funds, so that the Pentagon could draw down some of these stockpiles and send them over to Ukraine. MH, thank you. Anne Marie in DC. Maria Tadeo over in Brussels. Bank of America just published in moments ago on retail sales here in America mm. off the back of what's happening with gasoline prices. They say the following. Total card spending was up 5% year over year in August. We forecast a solid 0.8% increase in core wow. control group retail sales. The plunge in gas prices supported spending, Tom, in other categories. <clears throat> so that's some good news out there, at least. This is just channeling what I'm talking about. 70% of the economy We've got all sorts of people. Jim Glassman at J.P. Morgan is heated in his 50 years of coverage of the street uh, that we are underestimating the consumption surge in America. Uh, Jim Bianco joins us right now. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. <clears throat> Jim, fantastic to catch up with you, sir. What do you make of this pullback in commodities, gasoline in America, that gas here in Europe? Yeah, I think it's part of the um, the cycle that these markets go through. I mean, if you take net gas in Europe, it got a little overdone a couple of weeks ago. And while it's definitely pulled back a lot, this is the old Wall Street thing. Are we more impressed that it's 40 or 50 percent off the high, or are we worried that it's still 400 or 500 percent <laughs> off of the low from two years ago? Uh, I'm more worried that it's four or 500 percent off of the low. Regarding gasoline, in the, or gasoline or crude oil in the United States, um, count me in the camp that thinks that that market is deeply oversold right now. The pessimism is running high. Everybody seems to want to talk about $70 crude oil as opposed to a rebound to $100 crude oil. At least that's the way that I see it. And I think we're setting up a low. You think that we're setting up a low to a new high? Is that what you're suggesting? I mean, there's sort of, a, just based on what John was reading earlier about the Bank of America card data, it's almost this unfortunate cycle that if you get lower gasoline prices, you get more spending, and then you get a faster economy, and then you get an economy that needs a Fed to really halt the brakes. So at what point are you looking for that uh, surge in demand to take back over in the crude market? Oh, I think that this surge in demand is going to take over immediately. I agree with that survey. You know, you've already had a $1.20 decline in the price of gasoline. And it's also worthy of note that tomorrow is the CPI report. The Bloomberg estimate is minus one-tenth of a percent because of the fall in gasoline prices. But that has not stopped the market from putting a 90 percent chance that the Fed is going to raise rates 75 basis points. So if we print minus a tenth tomorrow, still expect 75 basis points. We need to have something more than that. Actually, I think we're probably going to turn our attention now to the core CPI measures, because those are what are going to matter. And that spending surge will probably show up in core. And that's really where the Fed and everybody will pivot to as far as where they're going to go next with Fed policy and what's next for inflation. Jim, we're in London, and we've been hearing a lot about an energy situation that's quickly moving and looks marginally better. Perhaps not when you look at the, uh, the, 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 the pace off the base, but when you look at, for example, just the trend of uh, natural gas prices coming down, how concerned are you about the fiscal landscape with com countries looking to borrow to plug the gap, but not necessarily reduce the demand? And I'm talking about the United Kingdom. No, I am very concerned about that. Uh, there's two things here. First of all, while the price of natural gas is coming down, the storage for natural gas is about where you would have expected it to be in the middle of September. So there's no lack of storage. But the price that they've paid to get that storage is about 600 percent more than they did last year or two years ago. Somebody's got a huge bill they've got to pay. So that's mm. either going to show up in higher energy bills or it's going to show up in higher taxes. And if they think that they're going to 
bridge that gap with more uh, borrowing, well, you're going to do it at a time, let's take the UK, when the Bank of England is aggressive on raising rates, is not going to be there to support the market if there's going to be a big jump in fiscal right. borrowing. And it's going to be very, very difficult for that. So it looks like they've either got higher taxes or higher energy bills or a combination of the two. Jim Bianco, I want to steal from the great John Writing with his Bank of England and Federal Reserve experience. Why are we afraid of higher interest rates? Aren't higher interest rates a sign of a resilient economic America? Interest rates can go up for one of two reasons. If they're going up because of strong economic growth, real growth, that's a good thing and you want to encourage higher interest rates. If they're going up because of inflation and to ward off higher inflation, that is a worrisome thing. And it's been the latter. It's been inflation that's been driving it. Fair. Now, if we yes. ever pivoted to the point, if we ever pivoted to the point where we're talking about booming economic growth, which we are not, we've just had two negative GDP right. quarters. Then we could talk about higher interest rates being good, but that's not the case now. Right. Okay. But that's beautifully explained, Jim. It's a clinic. But the bottom line, Jim Bianco, is somewhere on the inflation continuum, we flip over to that good news. Is that at a 5-ish 4% inflation rate, or do we got to get down to Chairman Powell's 2.6%? Well, if you believe the chairman, it's going to be probably closer to 2.6, and we're probably going to have to see a lot more evidence that inflation has peaked other than gasoline prices have fallen for the last two months. Don't get me wrong. That's great that they have, but that's just not going to be enough to move the needle when it comes to the Fed, in my opinion. Hey, Jim, you're going to stick with us. We're lucky to have you with us going into the opening bow there. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. I want to get you some movers going into the opening bow as well. I believe we've got those movers <coughs> with Abby. Hey, Abby. No Abigail Doolittle, I'm afraid, although I was given direction that Abby might be there, Tom, so that's unfortunate. Coming up around the opening bow, Seema Shah, Chief Strategist She's of Principal placing Global orders. Investors. I imagine she Seema emailed Shah me. is ready to go. Abby emailed me like an hour and a half ago, and she said, are you coming out of triple leveraged all cash? And I said, no, I just can't do it today. So maybe she... You think Abby's doing some work? She's popping on margin there right now. I wonder if Seema Shah's doing some work on this equity market yeah. as well. In about 20 minutes, you'll have some stunning pictures coming out of Scotland, Tom, as the king, King <clears throat> Charles III, makes his way from Holyrood House over to St. Giles Cathedral, walking behind... The Queen's Coffin, Tom, deeply emotional scenes that are set to take place in Scotland. And at, in the, about 20 at the minimum, John, this is back to the Stuarts of Charles I and Charles II and the uproar of the 17th century. But quite frankly, I'm no expert in it, but it goes back, John, much, much further uh, in the royal history. This from Hollywood House up the Royal Mile. We can talk about that as we see those images, and we'll bring them to you on Bloomberg Radio as well. But I just really can't say enough about the choreography here as the coffin of the Queen moves to London. Lisa? Yeah, honestly, this has been a regime change, and it comes at the precipice of a massive shift in a lot of different aspects throughout Europe. And so we're watching sort of a historical representation of a changing of the guards on multiple fronts, and it is incredibly emotional for a lot of people. Got a lift in this equity market as well, so we've got to carry two things at once and cover two things at once. So let's pick <clears> up on the price action for you and look at the equity market stateside on the S&P 500 futures pushing higher on the S&P, yields pushing lower on a 10-year yield. We've talked a lot about the 10-year in America yields higher for the last six weeks or so. Equity futures taking shape as follows, up four-tenths on the Nasdaq, on the S&P, up a half of 1%. Mm. The bond market on twos, tens and thirties looks a little something like this. After climbing for six consecutive weeks on a 10-year yield, it's a bit lower, Tom, by three or four basis points. Dow futures up 76, nowhere near 33,000, You're just John, doing that to, to, to wind me up. To not that. Well, yeah, I think the Dow futures are germane this morning. I would note the <laughs> VIX has not popped down to a 22 level. Thanks for that, Tom. Thank you. Can Speaking I have a look at foreign exchange as well? Quick look at the euro with a dollar that's a whole lot weaker today. A euro that's a whole lot stronger. Euro dollar pushing on. From London, this is Bloomberg. My lords and members of the House of Commons, 
we gather today in remembrance of the remarkable span of the Queen's dedicated service to her nations and peoples. She set an example of selfless duty, which, with God's help and your counsels, I am resolved faithfully to follow. Guy Johnson joining us from London now on the latest. Guy, some deeply emotional pictures, scenes set to take place in Scotland just moments away. Yes, at 25 past John, you will see the Queen's body moving up the Royal Mile to St Giles. Um, it will have a royal escort. As you say, this is a deeply emotional moment. Uh, the, the Royal Mile is effectively lined with crowds. Um, you, you can start to see the, the start of that process now, um, and it will ultimately lead towards uh, a service of remembrance that will take place uh, at around mm. 3 o'clock this afternoon. So that, that's taking place. Uh, as we heard just a few moments ago, uh, the King has already spoken to, the, uh, to both Houses of Parliament, uh, just reiterating what we've already heard in terms of his commitment to uphold the Constitution uh, and continue what his mother started. Um, much of this, John, televised for the first time. When, when we saw the coronation of the Queen, that was the first time that had been televised. Much of this process, we've never seen this before uh, as, the, as the general population, but now most of this is being televised we get, a, we get an insight into how the process unfolds and what goes on behind the scenes. Guy Johnson, we have four children, the oldest and the youngest, 16 years apart. It sounds like any family out there as well. Tell us how these four children behind their mother's coffin, how they are perceived separately in England. One is the king. That is how he is perceived. That is a very clear line. Um, and, and the rest, I think, um, I, I think now will play a very different role. Um, there is going to be a slimmed-down royal family, Tom. That is the direction of travel. Certainly the king has spoken about this in the past. Uh, you are going to see a much bigger focus, for instance, on the new Prince of Wales, his family. That is where the focus is going to be. Everybody else will become increasingly peripheral, I think. Guy Johnson. Thank you, out of London. Guy, many people have echoed those comments over the last week or so. When we get more on these pictures in just a moment, we'll continue to follow some of that for you as we work our way towards next week, next Monday, when we have that funeral service for the late Queen. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research is back with us. Jim, we've talked a lot this morning about how the problems for many of these leaders, many of these political leaders, aren't going to go away. They may well pause this time next <coughs> week for a moment, but the problems will still be there. What we witnessed last week was an unprecedented fiscal plan come out of this government uncapped, uncapped liability. Sterling was weaker, yields were higher. Sterling's stronger today. Now, Jim, do you view that as just a break, just a sigh of relief for a moment, or a change? No, I'm putting it in the um, sigh of relief camp. Uh, the dollar, if you will, the opposite of the currencies, is, you know, a risk-off asset. When things are weak and the world is uncertain, the dollar rallies. And when equities rally and people have breathed a sigh of relief, the dollar goes down. I'm only going to put that into that camp right now because I don't think what we've seen with it is anything, you know, more than that. And that especially applies for the uh, dollar pound cross. That's the currency story. There's a credit story for this as well, Jim. And we were talking a little bit about this earlier. What is going to be the consequence on sovereign yields in the UK and even to some degree in Europe as they try to shore up their consumer balance sheets by borrowing money? How much more do we have to go with that kind of credit premium, risk premium put into sovereign bond yields in the UK and in Europe? Oh, we've got, I believe we've got a lot more to go. They're going to have, for on one side, they're going to have vastly higher inflation. That is going to be driven largely by energy. On the other side, they're going to have central banks, especially the ECB, finally catching up. Madame Lagarde, or laggard as I like to call her, is becoming a little less laggard in trying to catch be up nice, with raising Jim. rates. <clears throat> okay, I'll be nice. Uh, she's trying to uh, <laughs> you raise rates a little bit more aggressively. Uh, so we're going to see that. And you're right. On the, on the other side of the equation, you're either going to get massive fiscal borrowing or you're going to get higher taxes. All of this is a big cocktail for higher inflation, more supply, higher interest rates. It's also a prescription possibly for a recession. The Bank of England has taken the um, unprecedented step last month 
of predicting a recession would start in the fourth quarter. I don't believe any G7 central bank has ever predicted a recession. They always tell us we're going to have a soft landing. And then when we have a recession, they announce it's over. But this is one where they said a recession is coming. Well, but that's not even stopping them from raising rates. So it looks like higher interest rates across the board. They've suggested it a recession. It's not as how, if, if Bank of England, yes, your uh, European Central Bank has not taken that step. The Federal Reserve of it the United not. States has not taken the step. The Bank of England has been sort of the outlier with respect to a good degree of perhaps some would say honesty. I am wondering, though, Jim, what this read through is. If you get higher yields in the euro area and in the United Kingdom on the heels of this two pronged whammy, what does that mean for the U.S. Treasury market? Does that bring up some of the yields in the long end? I think it does. I think it does. Be, uh, as global <clears throat> rates go up, there'll be enormous pressure on interest rates to move higher in the U.S. And I think as the Federal Reserve continues to raise rates, that'll even put higher rate, uh, pressure on the long end of the curve. The terminal funds rate, according to the Fed Fund Futures contract, is 4 percent. That seems to be the number everybody's focused on. All the rate hike cycles back to 1987, the two-year note ends its or peaks above the terminal rate. So if that history holds, you're going to get at least a 4% to your note, if not much higher. And that would mean that we're either looking at a, a record inverted yield curve of minus 75 basis points or 50 basis points, or what I think will happen is that the long end will be dragged higher too. And I don't think that June may, or June might have been the high of the year, but will come at a minimum, will come very close to ma matching that yield or maybe slightly taking that out before the end of the oh. year. It's an interesting call to the end there. Hey, Jim, it's good to hear from you. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research on the bond market and President Laggard. <laughs> John, if you and I said that, we would be so time hey, out. Jim, just repeating what Jim said. It was I, I know. Said. It wasn't us, folks. I've heard him say that before. Well, I think it raises the question also, Lisa. They talk about front loading. Yeah. Other people would just say this is late. Right, exactly. This is, this is scrambling. Oh, I like that. I like, like that. I haven't heard that. that late loading. Well, they're, 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 they're loading it good. at a time when you're already heading into a recession, so it doesn't give them a lot of leeway. We heard Isabel Schnabel just a moment ago reiterating this idea that they're going to hike rates more. She sounds very hawkish, doesn't she? They all sound hawkish. The market still doesn't want to doesn't want to see hawks. Equity futures up a half of 1%. Was that on the edge of being philosophical? I don't want to see hawks. I was just still thinking of your image. I'm 21. What are the hawk oh, of, of on, the with a hawk on his shoulder with a <laughs> tattoo of a hawk on his, on his <laughs> left arm? <laughs> the opening bell up next. This is Bloomberg. The opening bow just around the corner, seconds away. Equity futures positive, a half of 1% on the S&P. Nice on the Nasdaq 100, up a half of 1% also. In the bottom market, switch up the board. Yields look like this. Six consecutive weeks of yields higher. Today, lower by two or three basis points, 328.31. And as you can see right now, dollar weakness, the big story. Euro strength, euro dollar, back to 101, 101.24, positive eight-tenths of 1%. With your movers around the opening bow, I'm very pleased to say that joining us now... It's Abby. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, we do, of course, have that S&P 500 higher, as you were mentioning, and we're seeing something we haven't seen since early July, four up days in a row. So you, Tom, and Lisa have all been talking about this rebound that we're having. It is sustained. A big piece of it, Apple, up 1.3% over the last two days, up more than 3%. This on positive pre-order data for that iPhone 14. Not only that, but it's really showing a shift toward the higher price pro. Plus, they may not have raised prices, but they're holding pricing, high pricing, uh, even given inflation. Occidental Petroleum up with oil higher, sharply higher, up about 1.3 percent. But of course, also on the news or the no news that uh, uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has a 20.2 percent stake and also has the ability to take that as high as 50 percent. Bristol Myers Squibb up 7.4 percent. Their oral psoriasis drug was approved by the FDA. So a binary event producing a binary jump. And then finally, Disney, well higher than its pre-market highs, up 1.3 percent. Activist investor Dan Loeb, as you know, yesterday on Twitter saying that he's giving up the push to remove ESPN from Disney. It's, of course, one of their crown jewels, a big piece of the number. So Disney today up 1.3 percent, John. Abby, thank you. Three days of gains on the S&P becomes four. The S&P 500 up six tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq up by around about six tenths of one percent as well. Joining us now, Seema Shah, chief strategist at Principal Global Investors. Seema, you haven't been constructive on this equity market. It's bounced back. 
What do you make of this move? Is it one you can get behind this time around? It's not, John. Um, we are still uh, quite negative about the outlook. We think this is a, you know, they, you're going to get these kind of moments where there is some positivity in the market. Um, you're going to get these hopes that actually the Federal Reserve, the ECB, the Bank of England, kind of each central bank, um, that they may not have to go so far that inflation will fall far quicker than we expect. But the truth is, is that, look, inflation, yes, it's on the way down, but it's going to move very, very slowly. And we have heard time and time again from central banks around the world, um, from uh, people that are on the council of each central bank, that they need to raise rates pretty aggressively. And they've got further to go, even if there is an economic slowdown. So we're listening to that message and we're saying the extra right. market has got all the challenges ahead of them. But what's the linkage here of bonds to equities? If I'm in equities, I need to reallocate, I need to rebalance, or maybe just the courage to buy the marginal share. What can I take away from bonds? So at the moment, we have moved to that overweight duration position. You know, we don't see them being particularly um, a lot of movement in U.S. Treasuries for the time being. We think they're going to be quite range bound because at least in the U.S., certainly the, the recession risk is still a little bit further out. Uh, we're still seeing a pretty strong economy. But I think at this point, you can see Treasury yields probably remaining pretty range bound between 315, 330. Um, but then as you get into Q2 to then start moving down. So this is a decent time, I think, a different level to increase exposure to U.S. Treasuries, especially as we start to prepare uh, for that time where risk assets really start to struggle again. I look, uh, Seema, at this linkage of bonds and all the economic data, and we're hinged on CPI Tuesday. Is Seema Shah hinged on CPI Tuesday? Is it really that big a deal? So I don't know if I'm hinged on it, but certainly the CPI Tuesday is an incredibly important number. But if we see, as we are anticipating, that core inflation stays pretty high, um, around the 6% level is what we're anticipating, then that to us is a, is a green light for the Fed to continue raising 75 basis points at the next meeting. And then obviously not, not necessarily moving it, continue 75 basis points, but at least to suggest that there is further to go. Now, if we are wrong, so, and actually you do see core inflation coming down further, then, of course, it's a pretty different story. And you could see this market rally that we've seen over the last couple of days be a little bit more sustained. Seema Shah, thank you. Seema, we've got to leave it there. Thank you very much. We're just starting to see some movement here, Tom. Queen Elizabeth's coffin. Starting to begin the journey from Holyrood House down the road, down the Royal Mile towards St. Giles's Cathedral. Those pictures just coming through from Edinburgh now, Tom. This is maybe for our viewers and listeners, the house, the castle, the mansion, whatever you want to call it, that's a little less known, John. And it is a house. It is low slung across the fields. The fields behind it are absolutely beautiful. Major uh, change there in the time of Victoria and Edward. Uh, but it, 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 there's, a, there's an interiorness to this, John. Windsor's out there. Balmoral's out there. This is within Edinburgh, and of course, to, to move up the hill, the Royal Mile to St. Giles, uh, is old Edinburgh. We told uh, Lisa that following the coffin, moving in a hearse, will be the King, the Princess Royal, the Duke of York, and the Earl of Wessex following on foot. Other members of the royal family will follow in cars. This is the next stage, the next phase of a sequence of events through this week onto the ceremony next Monday, Lisa, the service the funeral service for Queen Elizabeth. The final march to say goodbye to a matriarch, not only of a family, not only to a nation, but honestly to the world having met with more foreign leaders than anybody else. And we are hearing about uh, anecdotes of people in this community who knew her because she was there and she would say hi. And so the emotion is palpable in the crowds of people who have assembled. Tom, this is something we'll continue to follow through this morning onto the service. <clears throat> next week. The mile is now hugely touristy. I'll be honest, John, the first time I visited, I think I've been twice, I was thunderstruck of how touristy it's become. But the history that, that is hidden by the tourism of it is substantial. One of the great moments I had with Bloomberg is up the Royal Mile towards St. Giles, an interview that I did for Bloomberg on the porch of Adam Smith's house. That is the level of history that's involved here. It is the only remaining existing residence of Adam Smith. And it's, it's not, it, it's, it's obscure, John. It's not, there's so much history involved here that Adam Smith's only house of 1790 is just an item.
We're about six or seven minutes into this session, Tom. That's something else we'll have to cover as well. Your equity market is positive six tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq of six tenths <coughs> of one percent. I understand Guy Johnson standing by. Guy, guide us all through the next sequence of events as we work our way through to next Monday. Uh, what you're going to see, John, today is obviously a lot of ceremony. Uh, this whole process that is now unfolding in Scotland, uh, leading towards the remembrance service uh, that is ultimately at the other end of the Royal Mile, uh, from where those pictures are now, a royal escort is going to take place. <coughs> then, then you're going to see effectively the king spreading out. So he is going to visit the, the four corners uh, of the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, this is about, in some ways, establishing him as king. But it's also going to be a message that he has already conveyed and will continue to convey about continuity, that he will continue to build on what his mother has done. Now, it starts to get a little bit more complicated as we work our way around the United Kingdom. Clearly, Northern Ireland uh, has a difficult and historic relationship um, that has always been fraught with the royal family. Um, you need to think about what is happening in Scotland right now. Now, the Scots have made it clear, those that would prefer independence, that even if independence were to occur, the royal family would continue as the royal family. But politics starts to kind of uh, intercede into this process. And it's going to be interesting as well, because the new prime minister is also going to be part of that process, there is a concern that already there may have been a, a, a blunder by starting to mix the process of politics and royalty and that could be a very difficult combination. Guy, there will be an audience in attendance at St. Giles in Edinburgh, and then there is an audience at Westminster Hall. How will London and how will the royal family take on the hundreds of thousands of people estimated to walk by the Queen's coffin? It'll be a balancing act, Tom. This is a royal family that has evolved significantly uh, over the last few years, has become more open. The king himself has become more familiar uh, with, with dealing with these kinds of situations, with dealing with the, the, the general public. Um, I, I, I met him in a small Devon town once with, with, his, with his wife, now the king and the queen. They, they were affable and friendly and, and chatty and interesting. So they, they, become, they become used to this process. But ultimately, this is still about burying the Queen burying their mother. So it's going to be a balancing act between those two processes. And there is historical precedent that must be continued. But all of this will happen in a way that has never happened in the past, in the glare of the television lights. And that is, that is how the situation has evolved. We're getting an insight into so much more than we've never seen before. Guy, this is an unprecedented moment in so many different ways. From your vantage point, there is unity that a lot of people can see of the affection and the feelings of sorrow having to do with Queen Elizabeth II. How is the unanim unanimity or how united are people about support of the monarchy as a theory? I, I don't th there is not a strong Republican movement in this country. Uh, it, it, if, if you were to have a... If you were to have a vote tomorrow, the, the monarchy would win every day, and, uh, like, every day, every day, every day. There is no, there is no risk there. There's a slightly stronger Republican movement in Scotland, but even there, it's not particularly strong. So I don't think I don't, that there's no kind of risk to the royalty here. But I think what there is is, and we spoke about this a few minutes ago, uh, I think there is a need to evolve the monarchy, evolve who is at the core of that and where the focus is. And that, I think, is going to happen. So Tom asked me in, in, uh, a few minutes ago about, about the four children. Three of them will become increasingly peripheral, and many royals will become increasingly peripheral. The focus will be on the line of succession. Charles, William, George, that's how the process is going to evolve from here. So that, I think, is going to be mm -hmm. a different royal family for a different country. A guy, there may not be a risk to the monarchy, an immediate risk. Is there a risk to the union anymore? Much is made about Scotland's push for independence. It seems to many that perhaps that push doesn't have the strength it once did many years ago. I think it's very hard to say. John, I think this is a situation that is very much in flux. Um, we're going to have elections. We've got elections coming up. I, I, I think it's too early to judge how those elections are likely to go. Uh, the new prime minister has dismissed a call for another referendum, but that may become very difficult to refuse. I think there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot in flux here, and clearly Brexit has made that more difficult. We also have a general election coming up. 
in the United Kingdom in 2024, maybe potentially even sooner. That could also be part uh, of this process as well and a potential catalyst. It would be interesting to see ultimately how a Labour government would deal with this question, particularly if a coalition was required. So I think there are a lot of moving parts here, John. I think the issue of the solidity of this union has become increasingly fluid. Guy, thank you. Looking forward to your coverage in around about 18 minutes time. Guy's going to pick up on the coverage and also going to lead you through the first few hours of the open stateside with equities up for a fourth straight session. And I have to say, four straight days of gains on the S&P 500. The longest winning streak, Tom, it's going back the to way. the start of July. There is a bid on. It is the way, John, the futures have added on through the morning for the most part as a generalization. I'm waiting for a VIX of 22. I don't have it yet. Dow 155 signals to me it's a blue chip morning, and certainly we saw that in Abby's equity report. Are you going to run away now? I'm going to run away We're going to catch up with you tomorrow. We've got a lot going on. I really, for those on radio, the imagery is extraordinary uh, here. And with Guy Johnson, we're very fortunate in the next hour with some real perspective. Uh, Lisa and I are going to catch up with Sri Sankaran of Morgan Stanley. Looking forward to that with your equity market positive for a fourth straight session up seven-tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. With Tom Keane and Lisa Rabbits, I'm Jonathan Farrow. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg. I support continued increases in the FOMC's policy rate. And based on what I know as of today, I support a significant increase at our next meeting on September 20th and 21st to get the policy rate to a setting that is clearly restricting demand. Governor Waller is ready to go once again on September 21 when the Federal Reserve meets, convenes to raise interest rates and perhaps by 75 basis points. Again, once more, Mike McKee joins us on the latest. Mike, tomorrow's CPI day. It is all about inflation in America. Absolutely, John. I feel a little bit like Bob Barker, who somebody nobody in England would know anything about. Or, and most Americans uh, under the age of uh, maybe 30 would not know either. But he was the host of an American game show in which contestants had to guess the price of goods. Well, that's what economists in the U.S. are doing right now. They are guessing the price of the CPI, where we come in, and it looks like we're going to come in down a little bit on the headline and on a year-over-year -year basis, which would be seen as good news in the markets. The core unchanged, and the forecast is it rises on a year-over-year -year basis because of base effects. That's something people are going to be watching closely. But some of the big indicators that go into this have performed well for the month of August. Gasoline prices, of course, down significantly for three months in a row, and used car prices is one of the big reasons that inflation went up early on have tumbled and so that should help the core a little bit uh, that leaves us uh, with the fed probably going 75 anyway because there are warnings about what will happen if oil prices go back up again janet yellen warning this weekend goldman morgan stanley say the price could go into the hundreds but for right now it is good news. And so the rest of this week, all about the Benjamins, which is another American expression about $100 bills with Ben Franklin's face on it. CPI and real earnings tomorrow. We get mortgage applications on Wednesday and PPI. Retail sales on Thursday. Are people still spending in the face of inflation? And of course, import prices will tell us something about oil and overall prices. And then Michigan sentiment. That's been a big deal, of course, the last couple of months because what people think is happening to inflation matters a lot to the Fed, John. And Mike McKee, thank you, sir. It all translates. It all translates. We all understand. Sri Sankaran joins us now, head of US and European Credit at Morgan Stanley. Sri, I'll start with the Lisa Abramovitz question, shall I? And then Lisa will no doubt follow up. All of these things that the Fed are trying to lean against and credit spreads are tightening again. They're not wider. Why? Yeah, it's a bit of a head scratcher. I think part of the equation here is that credit fundamentals still look OK. So the credit market kind of can withstand uh, a mild recession if it's a technical one. And if we're kind of still solving for earnings growth to be holding up at where the bottom up consensus is, which we disagree with, I mean, it does feel like credit markets are pricing in some degree of deterioration, but not really a default wave. 
Okay, but Sri, I understand that perhaps there's a more constructive backdrop, but the rally in credit's been somewhat significant. It's been uh, pretty impressive considering that people still see recession risk looming large and that people still see the concern with the lockdowns in China. And it's even come with more borrowing, even in the high yield debt market. Do you think that perhaps people are a little over their skis and their enthusiasm for the instruments? So, Lisa, I think, uh, yes, short answer is that our view is that directionally spreads are headed wider into year end. And we do worry more about downgrades and part of the leverage credit complex and so on. But I think coming out of the summer, there's still this bias that investors were positioned defensively. So in some way, it's like the technicals of the market are creating this sharp counter trend move a tighter with respect to credit spreads. But agree with your earlier point that, yeah, I mean, it does feel like the market's now underpricing recession risk. And that's kind of why we still have a clear up in quality bias. And we do worry more about fundamental deterioration as we get into the back half of the year and into early next year. So we're in London right now, and we've been talking all morning about the possibility of nations in the euro region raising cash through uh, debt markets in order to plug fiscal gaps while they try to support households that are coping with high energy bills. How is that going to play out in the credit world? Hey, sorry, at least there's some kind of uh, interruption with the, the audio. But uh, to your point, I mean, it does feel like it's a somewhat of an unstable equilibrium where you are getting this fiscal impulse, which is supportive for parts of the consumer complex. And that's kind of why we have seen portions of the, the UK consumer complex, be it the retailers or pub names, rally pretty sharply on the back of the, the announcements last week. But I think the end of the day, it is still kind of complicating the, the central bank's reaction function because the, it does add a bit of the inflationary impulse. And I mean, by and large, these fiscal transfers are not a free lunch. And therefore, you should see that reflected partly in the peripheral spread widening. And that, again, again would put the, the central banks, again, in a bit of a tough spot. The, the thought process here is that, yes, it does temporarily create this relief rally but it doesn't really structurally solve the problem of elevated energy prices. Hey, Sri, sorry for the technical problem there. We're going to have to let you go, and hopefully we can catch up again soon. Sri Sankaran there of Morgan Stanley on credit. It's a head-scratcher for him. It's a head-scratcher for others, but risk is rallying again, going into the Federal Reserve decision next week and going into a CPI print tomorrow morning. Here's a headline for you, Bramo, from the New York Times. Goldman preparing for layoffs as deal-making slows and... Perhaps that's not a surprise to some people. These are some divisions that were really beefed up coming up at, at the uh, pandemic because we had so much activity. That activity in some places has screeched to a halt. And you're going to see the threat to profitability for some of the banks as a result, particularly in those areas. A lot of people were expecting this. The, the question is, how, what, what's the scope going to be? Right? How much are you going to see cuts on Wall Street? Will it be the normal culling? of units that aren't as active as usual, or will it be something more in the face of a recession, and how much will that be sort of a, a bellwether in some ways of what's to come? Goldman excluded from this part of the conversation, but banks have wanted higher interest rates for, for how long? Uh, particularly in Europe, too. I mean, can you imagine, Wait. Lisa, you've got the European banks, they've yeah. wanted higher interest rates. Get away from negative interest rates. They've been asking for that for about 10 years since it started back in 2014. They get them, and we've got to go from one crisis to another. Are you basically implying that they get what they wanted and they're still complaining? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying they've got what they wanted at a very, very unfortunate moment. Well, it's for a the very, wrong reasons, but, right? But it shows how it's not necessarily the boon that they thought it was going to be, right? And that sure. that's, the, that's the concern for a lot of people and why those shares have been so unloved, why people have not been going into bank stocks, because they're not going to do well in an environment where you're not getting the same kind of commercial activity and the same kind of deal making. And that's really the conundrum that's facing. The whole financial sector. They're getting it because inflation is burning really, really hard. Stagflation. That's the problem. Final word on CPI tomorrow? The core is going to be the key. Stripping out the energy costs. We all know what gasoline prices are doing. We could see it on a big billboard when you go past the uh, pump every single day in the United States. The other issue is rents. The other issue is grocery bills. We haven't talked a lot about that. But that's been huge. And that's really been driving sure. prices up uh, quite significantly. A guy chance is going to pick things up from here in about five minutes' time. As we've said repeatedly through today, just a momentous week in the history of the United Kingdom and stunning scenes coming from Edinburgh right now. A seamless transition of power from Queen to King, from mother to son, and a scene showing King Charles III walking behind the hearse carrying his mother's coffin, heading from Holyrood House to St. Giles Cathedral. From London, this is Bloomberg.